For the record, my name is Liz Braden, District Councillor for District 9. I am the Chair of the Boston uh, uh, City Council Committee on Redistricting. I am joined by my colleagues this morning, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Louis Jean, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Bach and Councillor Baker. Um, this working session is being recorded. It, is live, it was being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity channel 8, RCN channel 82 and Fios channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.redistricting at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all councillors. Since this is a working session, there will not be any public comment period. Today's working session is on docket 1186, an ordinance amending City Council electoral districts. Docket 1215, an ordinance amending City Council electoral districts. Docket 1216, an ordinance amending City Council electoral di districts. Docket 1273, an ordinance amending City Council electoral di districts, and docket 1275, an ordinance amending City Council electoral districts. Docket number 1186 was sponsored by Councillors Arroyo, uh, Councillor Ricardo Arroyo and Tanya Fernandez Anderson, and was referred to the committee on September 28, 2022. Docket 1215 was sponsored by Councillor Erin Murphy and referred to the committee on October 5th, 2022. Docket 1216 was sponsored by Councillors Liz Braden and Brian Rowell and was referred to the committee on October 5th, 2022. Docket 1273 was sponsored by Councillor Frank Baker and was referred to the committee on October 19th, 2022. Docket Number 1275 was sponsored by Councillor Liz Braden and Ricardo Arroyo and was referred to the committee on October 19th, 2022. The committee held a virtual working session on September 16th, a working session in the Piemonte Room on September 20th, a virtual working session on September 25th, Working sessions in the Piemonte Room on September 26th and 27th, a public hearing on September 29th, a working sessions on September 30th and October 7th, a meeting to receive public testimony on October 11th, a working session on October 17th, an off-site public hearing in Fields Corner, Dorchester last Thursday, October 20th, a working session last Friday, October 21st, followed by a working session yesterday morning and a public hearing yesterday afternoon, Monday, October 25th. As chair of the committee on redistricting, I intend to submit a committee report at Wednesday's city council meeting under the matters recently heard portion of the agenda. It is my intention to recommend the council take action on one of the dockets present, presently before the committee. This final working session is for councillors to review data analysis presented and discuss potential language which may appear in a new draft presented by the chair. A note on demographic data coding methodology for redistricting purposes. It is important to note that the methodology used by the US Department of Justice to code race and ethnicity, ethnicity demographic data for civil rights enforcement and redistricting purposes this differs from how most demographers would categorize data for other purposes. The ESRI mapping software follows the conventions recommended by the Department of Justice in their September 1st, 2021 guidance on the use of racial and ethnicity data in redistricting. This differs from other commonly, 
commonly reported race and ethnicity groupings in that it groups those reported, reporting two races, one white and one non-white, as being members of the non-white race reported. Thus, a person reporting white and black would be categorized as black. All residents of Hispanic or Lat Latino origin, regardless of reported race, are grouped together. Because of this, you might draw the same district on both ESRI district redistricting and Districtor online mapping tool using the same 2020 census data, but each might present different percentages for the demographic breakdown. Districtor is an online mapping tool which allows for convenient sharing of online maps but the racial demographic breakdowns should be referred to as a rough estimate only. Official demographic breakdowns for redistricting purposes should rely on the data presented through the ESRI redistricting, ESRI redistricting using the Department of Justice criteria. This morning, the committee received a memorandum from Dr. Moon Dushan and Chanel Richardson at the MGGG Redistricting Lab, a research group at Tisch College of Tufts University. Dr. Dushan spoke with councillors at last Friday's working session, and the memo covers the effectiveness of electoral opportunities in city council districts. The memo has been distributed to all councillors, and unfortunately, Dr. Moon is unable to join us this morning. I will read the executive summary. We reviewed all elections initially provided to us by City Council staff and identified three with clear overall citywide people of, color, people of color candidates of choice. We built an effectiveness score from districts by measuring the performance of those candidates in the districts other elections could easily have been used for this, but we selected three contests to illustrate an effectiveness analysis under the time constraints of the compressed city council process. All five of the cities, the council's original proposed maps score quite low for, for this effectiveness score compared to other ways of dividing up districts. The Baker map is slightly less effective than all of the others, which are equal. All five new proposed maps received on October 25th also received the same scores as the original proposals. This means that there is not much variety on the table yet from the effectiveness point of view. You can view scores and stats for all of the maps in this spreadsheet of data, including compactness, demographics, and, and some electoral results. Below, we present four examples of different ways of configuring selected districts in significant, to significantly increase effectiveness. These are intended as examples only to be considered in light of local knowledge and experience. Finally, to put this in context, we show that respect for incumbents somewhat reduces the prospects of increasing effectiveness but that it remains highly possible, even under the constraint of avoiding double, bunk double bunking entirely. The analysis concluded by Dr. Dushin used a standard statistical test for racially polarized voting called EI, or ecological inference. It is used to estimate the rates at which different groups support different candidates. Looking at the 2021 mayoral campaign primary, Dr. Dushin's finding is, conclusion, it is not clear to a high level of certainty that the groups Black, Latino, and AAPI support the same candidate. There is likely to be more cohesion within neighborhoods than, in, than is seen citywide, but the citywide patterns for Latino and for AAPI voters are unclear. What is clear is citywide polarization, different preferences between overall people of color and overall white voters in this context. Dr. Dushin's memo also discusses effectiveness scores. We will come back to this memo during councillor discussion this morning. At this time, I would like to recognize two renowned experts joining us virtually as invited guests. Attorney Jeff Weiss, adjunct professor and senior fellow at the New York Law School and a specialist in legislative redistricting 
and Dr. Lisa Hadley, a, vo a voting data analysis. So, um, Dr. No, Attorney Jeff Weiss. Just also like to recognize that we've been joined by um, our colleague, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Mejia, and Councillor Arroyo, and Councillor Worrell. Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can okay, see you. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, before we hear from Dr. Handley, I'm going to take a moment or two just to review the, uh, the uh, legal um, uh, principles that you need to follow during this remaining days of the process. Basically, uh, the United States Constitution and the uh, Federal Voting Rights Act. Uh, and this was summarized in a memorandum uh, of October 9th that I had uh, submitted to the City uh, Corporation Council, uh, which some, of you, which most of you should. I think we've lost your sound, Attorney Wise. Deviation, deviation, or drift. Uh, that might mean from the average size of a district minus two and a half percent or plus two and a half percent but you have to work within a 10 percent window uh, the second uh, principle at the at the federal level is the voting rights act and the voting rights act is, uh, essentially ensures that minority voting rights are considered and that where there are significantly high levels of racially polarized voting, and this is something that Dr. Hanley will get into, uh, you may be required to create districts for uh, voters to elect their, for minority voters to elect their preferred candidates of choice. Uh, the other uh, remaining federal principle is the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. That prevents racial gerrymandering. Uh, and that prohibits the drawing of maps that excessively segregate voters on account of race. Uh, so you're looking at the Voting Rights Act uh, to prevent minority vote dilution, that you're not bringing districts too low in minority population to deny the minority voters the opportunity to elect their preferred candidate. And again, this occurs where there are, uh, where there is evidence of high levels of racially polarized voting, or as we call it, legally significant racially polarized voting. And then on the other hand, not to excessively pack districts where you're not looking at a Voting Rights Act problem, but simply putting too many minority voters into a district based on race as the predominant factor. The other law that you're going to need to follow uh, is the Boston City Charter. And that uh, contains three uh, freestanding criteria. One on compactness, that a district should have a minimum distance between all parts of a district. Uh, the second one is contiguity, uh, that all parts of a district need to be connected at some point with the rest of the district, and that the uh, districts include continuous precincts. And then the last criteria is the preservation of neighborhoods. Uh, that you respect boundaries of Boston's recognized neighborhoods to the extent that you can. Now, there are other non-binding criteria. They're not anywhere in federal law or city law, such as communities of interest, uh, bans on partisan gerrymandering, or maintaining cores of existing districts. Those are not criteria that you'll find in law, but something that could guide you, but they are not prioritized. They are not required. They're simply suggestive. So uh, that gives you the overall view of the legal criteria, one person, one vote, the Voting Rights Act, the 14th Amendment, and the Boston City Charter. So with that, uh, Lisa, do you want to pick up from there? I do. I would like to share my screen if possible. I have a little PowerPoint here. Let's see if this is going to work. It working. 
I can see it. Okay. <laughs> So I am a social scientist, I'm not a lawyer, and what I'm going to do is talk to you about an analysis of voting patterns that I did that is relevant to the law, but um, any legal questions will be directed towards Jeff, although he'll have to look to me to see what the numbers have to say. I want to talk about drawing districts that comply with the Voting Rights Act. So section two of the Voting Rights Act, unlike section five of the Voting Rights Act, which was done away with by the Supreme Court in 2013, section two of the act applies to all states and local jurisdictions, including, of course, Boston. Section two prohibits any voting standard practice or procedure, including a redistricting plan that results in the denial or dilution of the, uh, of minority voting strength. Section two was amended in 1982 to make it clear that you don't have to show intentional discrimination. In other words, you don't have to intend it to discriminate, but a plan could still have the effect of discriminating against minorities. Um, it, it's simply unintentional. So the test now is an effects test or does the plan that you've adopted result in denying or diluting minority voting strength? So our districting plan that violates the Voting Rights Act uh, does one of two things. It either cracks the minority community, a geographically compact uh, minority community across districts, so they are unable to elect minority preferred candidates in any one district, or if obliged to create at least one district, they pack minority voters into the, uh, into a single district so that minority voters have an opportunity to elect a candidate of choice in only one district and not in any of the four in this example surrounding this. Okay. When the act was amended in 1982, um, the first case to make it up to the Supreme Court um, for the court to interpret what the uh, effect test looked like was a North Carolina case called Thornburg v. Jingles. And the result of that case was what's called a three-pronged test to determine if a minority group qualifies for relief. And the first is that the group, minority group must be sufficiently large and geographically compact to form a majority in a single member district. The minority group must be politically cohesive. By that we mean they have to vote the same. And whites must vote as a block to usually defeat minority preferred candidates. And how do we know this? We know this by doing what's called a racial block voting analysis. This is a statistical analysis to determine whether minority votes, voters are politically cohesive and whether whites are block voting to usually defeat minority candidates. So that's what I've done in this case. And this is what I, and I'm, today I'm gonna to report to you the results of this, but first let me explain what we're doing. Of course, we don't have the race of the voter who cast the vote. So we're going to do a statistical analysis. We're going to use aggregate level data, precincts in Boston of a smallest unit for which election returns are reported. So we're going to use a precinct level database and we need two pieces of information about this precinct. We need to know the election results and we need to know the demographic composition of the precincts. Now in the South, in a lot of jurisdictions, we actually know the turnout by race in precincts. But in Boston, we substituted the voting age population. And this information was actually available online at Analyze Boston, the Analyze Boston website. It's, two, uh, it's 2020 census data. It's called the PL94171 redistricting database reported at the precinct level. So I was able to take precinct election returns and this demographic data, combine it, merge it into a single database and analyze that database to look for patterns across these precincts to estimate white, black, Hispanic, and Asian voter support for various candidates. Okay. 
Now, the easiest way to do this would be to identify precincts in which we know all of the voters are, for example, black. If all of the voters are black, we know how black voters are voting because that's all that we have in that person. That's called homogeneous precinct analysis. There are several drawbacks to that. First, of course, it may be the case that voters in these homogeneous precincts vote differently than voters who live in more integrated precincts. But the big, a big side, uh, a big reason you can't do it in Boston is you don't have any homogeneous precincts. Well, you have a handful of white homogeneous precincts, but you do not have any uh, black, Hispanic, or Asian homogeneous precincts. So instead, we're using, I'm using two methods, statistical methods. Um, one is called ecological regression analysis, and the other is called ecological inference analysis. Now, ecological regression analysis has been around for a very long time. This was used by the uh, expert in, um, Thor in Thornburg v. Jingles. Uh, that and homogeneous precinct analysis were the only two statistical techniques that existed at that time. Since Thornburg was decided, a professor at Harvard by the name of Gary King developed ecological inference. This is harder to explain but it is more accurate than ecological regression. At this point, I use ecological regression as a check on my ecological inference numbers and as an easy way to explain what it is that I'm doing. Let me start with ecological regression. This is a real county in Georgia. This is the 2021 uh, US Senate runoff with Warnock. I mentioned earlier that there are some southern ju jurisdictions that actually give us um, turnout by race, and Georgia is one of them. So along the um, horizontal axis is the proportion of the turnout that was black voters. So 0.4 means that 40% of the voters in that particular uh, precinct were uh, black voters. Along the vertical axis is the percentage of votes for Warnock. So we're going to place each of our precincts on this what's called a scatter plot, this graph, based on two things, the proportion black turnout in that precinct and the proportion of votes for Warnock. And what you can see here, I assume, is a very clear relationship. As the percentage of black turnout increases, the percentage of votes for Warnock increases. And we use this relationship to produce estimates of the percentage of black and non-black voters or white voters who supported Warnock. So ecological regression has a couple of problems associated. First of all, it's assuming a linear relationship. Second of all, voting is really polarized. It can produce, let me go, let me go back. No. It can produce estimates that are, say, above 100%. You could get an estimate of 120% of Black voters supported Warnock. So along came Gary King and developed a very sophisticated statistical technique um, that gets us around that. Now, instead of every precinct being a point, as it was on the previous graph, on this tomographic plot, Every precinct is a line that shows all of the possibilities given the two things we know about the precinct, and that is the demographic composition and the voting patterns. This line represents all the possible combinations of um, uh, voters in that situation that could have produced that result. And the statistical method called a maximum likelihood um, figures out the sort of greatest density of those points and produces an estimate using um, the statistical me mechanism. So that's a very <laughs> simple explanation of that approach. Um, but I use the two together because, um, as I said, I use ER as a check on EI. Um, they tend to be pretty close together, especially in the South where you have turnout by race. And here is the results of that analysis in this Georgia county. 
you can see that um, somewhere between 94.4 and 94.9 percent of black voters supported Warnock, depending on whether you're relying on the EI or the ER estimate. And we always rely on the EI estimate when the two vary greatly, but here this is not it, you know, somewhere above 90% of black writers are supporting Warnock. On the other hand, um, only about 25% of white voters are supporting Warnock, and the other 75% are um, his white challenger. This contest is racially polarized. If black voters had voted alone, they would have elected Warnock. If white voters voting alone, uh, they would have elected Loeffler. So this is polarized. It rises to the level of legally significant racial black voting if the, the candidate preferred by minorities usually loses. So it's polarized if they're voting for different candidates. It's legally significant polarization if the, in this case, the black preferred candidate usually loses. So we're looking at across a series of elections, not simply one election. Okay, so what does this have to do with Boston? So the, the courts and the Department of Justice recognize four, five, six minority groups as protected under the Voting Rights Act, or particularly under the redistricting component of the Voting Rights Act. In Boston, you have a significant enough population of Black, Hispanic, and Asians to conduct a racial black voting analysis. The other groups, you do not. We can't look at um, American Indian, Native Hawaiian uh, voters to determine if that, if those groups are polarized. But we can look at black voters, Hispanic voters, and Asian voters. Now, when I say you have a sizable minority population, I mean that population is sizable enough to do a voting analysis, of, uh, an analysis of voting patterns by race. I do not mean that the minority group necessarily meets the first prong of jingles, that is, that it is sufficiently large and geographically compact to form a um, single member, a majority of a single member district. Now, in fact, we know that black voters are, do meet this criteria because there is already a majority by district. I suspect that Asian voters are not, there are not in the Asian voters to do that, and probably not enough Hispanic voters, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so the three groups that we're going to look at, uh, the three minority groups we're going to look at, are Black voters, Hispanic voters, and Asian voters, and we're going to compare their voting patterns to white voters and also to each other. The election that I analyzed were municipal elections. And the reason for that is that the Voting Rights Act in the courts, particularly when interpreting the Voting Rights Act, has said the most probative elections are the elections for the offices at issue, the most recent elections, and elections that contain minority candidates. So I looked at uh, municipal elections from 2015 to 2021. I looked at districted city council elections and I looked at the mayoral election. I did not look at the at-large city council elections. And the reason for that is that it's quite complex to figure out how to decide how many votes voters actually cast in that because in fact they could, vote. They could cast four, three, two, one. It, uh, there's no what's called anti-single shot uh, prohibitions on voting. And so it's, it's complex to decide and somewhat irrelevant since we're talking about actually drawing districts which have a election of one um, rather than an election uh, to produce four winners. So these are the elections that I looked at. These are, uh, I write primaries here, I realize they're called preliminaries, but you're going to see primaries uh, throughout the, the rest of this. Um, so these are the elections that I looked at. I looked at each district election that occurred between 2015 and 2021 
both in the preliminaries and the general election, and I looked at the mail preliminary and general election in 2017 and 2020. Now, this is what the results look like when you do this analysis. This is a summary chart of the estimates of the percentage of white voters, black voters, Hispanic voters, and Asian voters who voted for each of the candidates who ran in the 2021 primary for mayor and the 2021 general for mayor. This is the race of the candidates. Remember I told you that the most probative contests are those that include minority candidates. So um, my summary tables will include the race of the candidates who ran. This is the actual percentage of votes they received. And then here are the estimates based on EI and ER for each of these candidates. Now, this EI subscript, uh, superscript one means that I actually used uh, EI uh, that was developed even after Gary King developed EI. It's called EIR times C because I have um, four groups that I'm interested in as opposed to two groups, of blacks and whites. So it's EIR times C, which is even more complicated to explain. Now, here we can see that the plurality of white voters, remember we're not focused on the EI estimate, voted for Michelle Wu. However, the plurality of black voters, I lost my cursor, voted for Kim Janey. Hispanic voters and Asian voters also supported Michelle Wu in the primary. So the mayoral primary in 2021 was polarized between white voters and black voters, but it was not polarized between white voters and Hispanic voters and Asian voters. And Black voters and Hispanic voters and Asian voters were not cohesive as a minority group in this particular election. Black voters preferred a different candidate than Hispanics and Asians. So this is the kind of information that we're looking for when we are analyzing all these elections. Now, let's turn and see what happens in the general election. In the general election, now all four groups, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians are supporting Michelle Wu and the contest is no longer polarized. So the primary in this instance was polarized, the general election was not polarized, and in the general election, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians were all cohesive in their support of Michelle Wu, who won the contest of 64% of the vote. So this is what I did for all of the districted elections and also the 2017 mayoral race. And rather than going through all of the tables, which will be included in a report, what I've done is I've summarized what I found. And the first thing I have to say is a lot of these contests aren't, um, aren't even contested. Even general elections, only about half of the elections that could have been contested were contested. So we have a lot of no contest. But I've marked whether contest was, whether there was no contest or whether the contest was polarized or not polarized for each of the districts. I should have said specifically this, the, the courts have said that you should do a district specific functional analysis. We want to know um, both citywide how minorities are voting, but in particular, it may be the case that they're voting differently in different areas of the city, right? So we're gonna do a district specific analysis. And this tells us where voting tends to be polarized and where it doesn't. So for example, uh, some districts like district nine and district eight have less polarization than say districts one and district six, which are more polarized. But I want you to notice that there are very few contests. So when I say that 100% of the contests in district one are polarized, it's only be, there are only two contests. They were both polarized, but it's only two contests. So the parentheses tells us how many contests were actually contested. And then the percentage is how many of those that were actually contested were polarized. 
Okay, so this is just a summary. And again, you'll get tables that go election by election, but now I just want to give you an overview of my findings uh, and open this up for questions. I should have mentioned at the start, I have a hard stop at noon, which is why I'm going through this very quickly, but nonetheless, here we go. Okay, first of all, again, a very limited number of contests. Even though I looked at every district that every district election that was contested, over 45% of the of the general elections, let alone the possibility of primary elections, were um, there were no challengers. So, voting is polarized in Boston, but it varies by district, and some districts, some areas, are more polarized than others. The amount of polarization, again, polarization, we're talking about white voters versus each of the minority groups individually. The amount of polarization between whites and blacks and whites and Hispanics is comparable. Now, the citywide, we saw it was polarized between blacks and whites and not between Hispanics and whites. But when you look district by district, um, there were just as many district elections that were polarized between whites and Hispanics as between whites and blacks. There is much less polarization between whites and Asians. <clears throat> in the six general elections in which voting was polarized, and there were only six, um, the candidate preferred by black and Hispanic voters actually lost four of, of those contests, so about 66%. The other point I want to make is when voting is polarized, Black, Hispanic, and Asian voters are not necessarily cohesive, particularly in primaries. So you need to be cognizant of the fact that you might not be able to talk about minority districts. You might have to talk about Black, Hispanic, or Black or Hispanic districts, opportunity districts, because you need to make sure that the voters are voting for the same candidates if you're going to talk about combining them. So because voting is often polarized, you need to provide districts that um, give minority voters an opportunity to elect their candidates of choice if they don't exist. If they do exist, and, and they do, um, you need to make sure to maintain the districts in a manner that continues to provide minorities with an opportunity to elect the preferred candidates, but caution needs to be exercised if combining Black, Hispanic, and Asian voters to create a minority district because they're not necessarily cohesive, and that's especially true of Asian voters. Okay, I went through that very quickly, I know, and I'm going to um, stop sharing and uh, take your questions, if you have any. Thank Jeff you. is here to help me to answer the questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, would any of my colleagues have any questions? Um, Councillor um, President Flynn, would you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, was, I, had, I had one question for Professor Weiss. Um, thank you, Professor, um, for your presentation. So just through, through some of my research, I just wanted to know, um, or if you had any cl clarification on whether there is a Voting Rights Act violation in District 4 as it is currently drawn. Um, that's one of the districts that may see the most changes is District 4. Um, and just wanted to see what your thoughts might be on that, uh, Professor. Nope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Handley and I haven't actually uh, analyzed the different plans that you're considering now. That's something that I think we, we uh, can do uh, when they're presented to us for the exact analysis. Uh, I don't want to say offhandedly, but I'm not aware uh, offhandedly that any of the current districts are violative of the Voting Rights Act, but we have you know, the levels of polarized voting or legally significant polarized voting really will tell us. And I think when you, when you present us with uh, a limited number of maps to review, then we'll best know 
uh, whether uh, a district would violate the Voting Rights Act or the 14th Amendment. Uh, we can get that done in a relatively short period of time, but uh, it, it, right now, because the current district must change, you know, it, it's too early to tell uh, what the legal ramifications of that change would be. Now, Lisa, do you want to add to that? Uh, only that uh, District 4, uh, as it is currently configured, provides black voters with an opportunity to elect their candidates of choice. And I think that you would want to continue to have a district that provides black voters with an opportunity to elect their candidates of choice, or you would violate the voting right, right. So, because so, voting is polarized. Right, so taking the current district too low by taking minority population out of the district, you risk the Voting Rights Act violation of diluting minority voting strength. If you add too many minority voters into the district, then you run the risk of uh, a 14th Amendment problem because uh, uh, drawing districts based on race and race alone raises red flags um, in the courts. Now, you can draw a district that simply includes a very compact, naturally occurring community of interest or neighborhood if within the population numbers. But if you cherry pick populations specifically because of race and add them to a district, then you run the risk of racial gerrymandering or packing under the 14th Amendment. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Councillor Baker, you had a question. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Um, so one one observance would be um, with your mayoral election grid you have here, Anissa Osabi George identifies herself as a woman of color, and you have her as white. I don't know what that means with with anything, but she herself identifies as a woman of color. So I think. Is the whole graph skewed? What I'm not really sure um, what that's what what that's telling us. And another question is around neighborhoods. Um, it's been said in some meetings, pointing at neighborhoods that were white neighborhoods. That in this exercise, white neighborhoods don't matter. That's been said in public, um, and um, so like white neighborhoods that are identified as a neighborhood. Is this body here able to go in and split those neighborhoods and put them in two different districts? Or, or, or even if you pick one whole neighborhood up and put it into a, another district, like, is that any kind of violation? Do, do, do white people matter at all in this equation? Oh, let me answer it in the context that you want to make sure that you are uh, uh, not violating the Voting Rights Act by, by diluting a minority community. So. If you don't have a situation of either diluting or cracking a minority community, or on the other hand, of packing a minority community district, then you can draw a district with white voters without any problem. The, the, the real key issue is not to dilute minority voting strength and not to pack excessively minority voting strength. If you don't do either of those two things, then drawing a district that might include a white neighborhood should not be a problem. But splitting a white neighborhood, if we're you looking at trying to keep neighborhoods together, splitting a white neighborhood, is that any kind of violation? No, you would split a white neighborhood to avoid a Voting Rights Act or 14th Amendment violation. Otherwise, you can keep a white neighborhood together. So you I would want that, to keep the white neighborhood together? You could, as long as you're not violating one of the federal questions here, either the Voting Rights Act or the 14th Amendment. Uh, in other words, if you're keeping a white community, a white neighborhood intact, and by doing so, a neighboring district or part of that district would violate the Voting Rights Act because it dilutes minority voting strength or it excessively packs minority voters unnecessarily, um, then you'd have a problem. But if neither of those two problems happen, then you should be okay. But if, but if, if, 
if it's an existing condition, there's nothing moving around. If we're talking about District, district 4, you know, a lot of the advocates have said they've got too many black people there. So that's an existing condition, and, and the, the percentage has actually changed in the last 10 years. It's actually gone, gone down, I believe, in, or, or rather up in white people by one percentage point. But if we're chasing percentage points based on race, and you go from 9.5% to 14%, and you disrupt neighborhoods that happen to be white, is, is that any sort of violation? Only, again, only if by adding and subtracting minority voters, you're running into one of the federal question issues. Adding or subtracting not, minority votes. Right. But otherwise, you, you should be okay. Um, and and what, about the, what about the question of um, listing Anissa Osabi George as white? She identifies as a, a person of color. Her father's from North Africa. Uh, I saw Dr. Hanley uh, gesturing during that comment, so maybe she can answer that. No, the, the race of the candidates doesn't actually matter. You're looking at the voting patterns, but uh, races that include minority candidates um, are more probative. Now, this contest is probative in any case because it already includes Blacks and Asians, it, but it has nothing to do with the estimates themselves. It only emphasizes the importance of that particular contest. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, doc, um, Councillor uh, Louis-Jean, you've got the chair, you've got the floor. I was just going oh, to- beg your pardon. I was just going to repeat what, well, well the doctor already uh, said it, that actually, again, it, what matters is the preferred candidate of the voters, not who the candidate is themselves. Now, you can often see a more stark contrast when there is a black candidate, and we're talking about the candidate, the preferred candidate for black voters, but that ultimately, at the end of the day, the identity of the candidate is not what matters. Again, the root, the origin is always the voter and what, how the voter and the voter of color is able or not able to express uh, their candidate of choice. That's correct. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dewey Jen. Um, Councillor Baker? What, and, and, and so how do we, do we all issue a, a um, a crystal ball to see what the candidates of choice are going to be in the next election. Or like uh, it, this, this is baffling to me. Candidates of choice when we don't know who they are. We're going to draw districts on candidates of choice when we don't. Uh, it's just a little bit confusing to me. Can you like, what is a candidate of choice? So, in order to determine if you're drawing districts that are likely to elect candidates of choice, we don't use a, a crystal ball. We use elections that happened in the past and we determine if the minority preferred candidates would carry that district. So for example, we would look at the mayoral contest. If we were drawing a black district, a district that we hoped would provide black voters with an opportunity to elect, we would draw the district lines and we would then see if, for example, Kim Jamie carried the district in that particular primary. So we're gonna go and look at candidates that we know are minority preferred and see how they do in the proposed district. This is, this is pretty standard court accepted methodology for determining whether you have an effective minority district or not. And this is the kind of study I referred to when we will let you know if the plan you're planning to vote on or a limited number of plans would actually you know, pass muster we would take the reconfigured election results and run them on the proposed new lines that you want to support. And that would tell us the likelihood, the so-called crystal ball, if I might, uh, on, on what that district, how it might perform. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Flaherty and then Councillor Mejia. And thank you, Madam Chair, and obviously to both um, Attorney Weiss and uh, Dr. Hanley, um, we had touched uh, base early on another uh, colleague's question about whether there were any uh, voting rights acts violations in District 4, um, and you indicated that you hadn't had a chance to take a look. Could you take a look at District 4 as well as District 3, because that seems to be where some of the tension in this process is, and if so, uh, how quickly could uh, you turn around an analysis 
with respect to the uh, whether there are, there are any Voting Rights Act violations in District 4 and District 3. So uh, I've already looked at the current districts 4 and 3. I, I assume that you mean any sort of proposed districts. A am I correct? Well, in, in, as they're currently configured, I guess the first question is, are there any VRA violations in District 4 right now? And are there any there in are District not. 3 right now? That's right. No. And then, as and, I mentioned before, District 4 is required by the Voting Rights Act because you do have polarization. It is an effective minority district. Right. And then in, and then moving forward in any of the maps that you've taken a peek at, are there any VRA violations in either of those districts? I have not looked at any proposed right. district plans at this point. This is something that would require the kind of analysis that I just described. And that is taking recompiled election results and seeing how the minority preferred candidates would do in any proposed district. Right. And then in your preferred candidate analysis, is any thought getting into the strength of the campaign, uh, the work ethic, uh, the coalition building, uh, the door knocking, sort of the, 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 the you know, shoes on the ground, if you will, uh, their fundraising capacity, policy issues, anything like that. Do any of those uh, criteria go into uh, so that it's sort of not on sort of monolithic where uh, a person of color just votes for a person of color or a white person just votes for uh, a white person that, uh, uh, and, and I'll use two recent examples. Most recent uh, election, the uh, primary for Attorney General, uh, my former colleague, uh, candidate for Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, uh, handedly beat her opponent, uh, white woman, Liz Reardon, in Ward 16, which is in District 3. And also, uh, Secretary of State Bill Galvin um, handedly beat uh, a woman of color, uh, Tanisha Sullivan, in uh, the Manhattan uh, section of District 4. So. I don't know how that squares up with the analysis, but again, I, I think um, credit has to be given to the, the candidate, him or herself, uh, the strength of their campaign, um, you know, uh, how hard they're working, uh, again, the bridges they're building, the coalitions that they're building, their policies, et cetera. Does any of those, and those are, cam and th those are campaign tactics, if you will, right? E every candidate, uh, myself included, I'm a citywide city council, a top vote getter in Boston, uh, white Irish Catholic, and I have tremendous support in and throughout the entire city. Uh, and particularly when you go into neighborhoods and districts and sub districts, it's because of relationship building. It's the strength of my campaign. It's the outreach. It's the bridge building. Uh, it's showing up. It's returning phone calls. It's doing the constituent service work, etc. Uh, I think that separates myself, and it's why I've had the longevity that I've had. So, uh, when folks talk about you know the candidate of their choice. Um, I think it falls short in terms of it's it's the candidate that's working hardest. It's the candidate that is building those relationships and those coalitions, particularly in a city like Boston, and which is a very diverse uh, city. All of our districts, frankly, uh, are diverse. So, I want to get your thoughts in terms of what other criteria go into sort of just one person voting for another person. What's the mindset and in the analysis? No, so let's make this clear. A minority preferred candidate is a candidate supported by minority voters. In other words, if 85% of black voters voted for a particular candidate, then that is the candidate of choice of black voters, even if he had a lot less money than the white candidate he ran across, even if he had a lot less connections. It's who the black voter supports. And it doesn't matter, in fact, how much money he has to run, uh, to run the campaign. It's just a matter of who black voters support. And so you may say, well, he didn't run a campaign across the city, and the answer might be, well, he ran a campaign with black voters because they support him. So it's really, a, it's a statistical technique, and it's geared towards finding who the minority supported, regardless of other factors. And this is, this is the courts speaking, not me. I mean, this is how the courts have determined what a minority preferred candidate is. Now, it may be the case that voting isn't polarized if, um, if white voters also support the minority candidate, but it's who the minority voters vote for, regardless of these other factors, that determine if you have a minority preferred candidate. The other thing I want to say is you pointed to some elections. Let me make it clear that the elections that are relevant here are not, for example, partisan elections. 
because different dynamics are operating. If, you're, if you've got a partisan election, you might have more white voters voting for a black Democrat in a partisan election than you would have white voters voting for a black in a nonpartisan election. So what's really relevant is what's happening in nonpartisan elections that most closely resemble the, um, the conditions of the city council elections. So I would be more interested in what happened to mayoral candidates than what happened to um, candidates that ran in partisan elections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Mejia, followed by Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Lisa and Dr. Weiss, for your presentation. Um, you know, I, uh, my colleague, um, makes reference all the time that you know he is the top vote getter but i think to your point in terms of like running and ethics and hard working you know i think that my particular race if you look at it i won by one vote in 2019 and two years later almost topped the ticket across the city of boston and that goes to show that when you elect your preferred candidate um you really see how representation really matters across the city. And I think that it's really important for us to just, when we think about the Voting Rights Act and we think about a success story, I think that my election in 2019 versus 2021 really speaks to what happens when you create opportunities for people who have less resources. Because if you look at our campaigns, I had less money, I had less clout, but we were still able to do a lot of work in the city of Boston, and I think that speaks volumes to why we're going through this exercise in this moment in time, because we need to create as many opportunities for folks to be able to be effective and viable across the city. And so I just wanna name that as something as we continue to go through this process, is that there are a lot of assumptions that are being made about people's ability um, to run successfully across the city of Boston. And I think that, you know, our campaign really shows what is possible. And I just want to name that. And then the last piece that I want to um, uplift here as we continue to, to go through this process is that I, I want to continue to remind us that this is not about us. This is a 10-year situation that whatever decisions we make here today are going to impact the next 10 years. And I hope and pray that folks aren't thinking about, you know, like there are the things that we could be doing, right? Like that's just not, this is not about holding on to our seats. This is about making sure that we're creating as many opportunities for people to be able to be viable candidates um, and run across the city of Boston, regardless of where you're from. Um, so I just want to uplift that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Here, um, Councillor Murphy, and then Councillor Worrell, followed by Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chair, and Councillor Flaherty um, touched on it already. So a lot of it you already answered. And thank you both of you for um, your presentation. I appreciate it. I did just want to um, just go back a little bit. So. In the primary for the state election and in Ward District 3, Ward 15 and 16, when we shared the um, results that Andrea Campbell beat um, Shannon Riss Laird in, in that election, they were both Democrats though, because I do know that there have been times when people go to the ballot in a partisan race, not in the municipal race, and they're registered a Republican or they're registered a Democrat and they realize that unless they pull an independent ballot, their candidate of choice doesn't even show up on the ballot and they've said, wait, I don't see their name, what happened? So that is a case where people realize they go to the poll to vote for someone and it wasn't in their party and they realize it's not the same as municipal elections, which everyone here understands that. but. Is it still true because in that race they were both Democrats, whoever went to vote across the city, across the, um, in the state actually, both of their names showed up. It wasn't like one or the other. So it wasn't voting party lines. Mm -hmm. And um, just a couple other things. I do agree that it's, it's not about the candidate, but being a good candidate definitely helps no matter what. And 
incumbents always do better. I mean, the history shows also once you're elected because it's a name recognition thing, right? So you run once, but the second time you run, the data always shows that you do, you do better unless something has happened for you not to do better, right? If you're not a good politician or you're not good at the campaigning the second time around. But those were just my two points. And maybe just clarifying on that issue about them both being on the same ticket in that. So, yeah. Oh, um, first of all, you're absolutely right. Incumbents um, tend to do a lot better um, than challengers. Um, the second point is it would a democratic primary would be more relevant than a general election but still not the same conditions as, uh, or at the same time at, well, I don't actually know. When was the attorney general's race? Was it an odd year or an even year? Just, um, yeah, it was this year. Yeah, so the, the conditions are just different, different but it, it is true that a democratic primary would be more relevant than a general election where you have a uh, partisan makeup, but it's still not as relevant as, say, a mayoral contest because it's a different time and a slightly different electorate anyway. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Worrell, I also want to like remind our colleagues um, that we, um, our guests are, are here until 12 noon, so we have about 15 minutes left, so uh, let's keep it moving. Uh, Councillor Worrell, also let me say, we will take down, if you have questions, uh, we, will, we can also submit them in writing to Attorney Weiss and Dr. Hadley and Dr. Dushin, uh, and then we hope to have a response to your questions by tomorrow morning if, if we don't get through it now. So, uh, Councillor Worrell, Councillor, um, Councillor Baker, and Councillor, Councillor Louis Jean. Uh, thank you, Professor Weiss and Dr. Hanley for your presentation and all the information that you're sharing with us. Um, I had a quick question about, um, uh, dilution of minority strength. How would how would you determine that? Is it a change in past uh, elections, you know, compared to new drawn maps? Like, how would you determine what is considered to be um, uh, dilution? And then, are you taking into consideration gentrification and you know, black people or you know, certain certain race group leaving the city when 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 talking about uh, dilution of uh, voting strength? Dilution of voting strength would happen if you could maintain a minority preferred, uh, if you could maintain a district that provides minorities with an opportunity to elect and you didn't, or you had one and it, um, it, per it, per it the, the effect of redrawing meant that it no longer provided minority voters with an opportunity to elect. However, there is a caveat there and uh, I, Every time I think of Alaska, I think of this. As Alaska natives moved out of the North Slope, all of a sudden there's nothing that you could have done to actually draw an effective native district in that area because population movement. So sometimes things like population movements will mean you can't maintain or a, a minority opportunity district that was once there. So, um, there's a difference between you can't and you don't. But if you can't, you can't. If you don't, but you could have, and you needed to, that's a different question, and that's a violation of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Baker and then Councillor louis -Jean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for your time today. Can can. One of you talk about, can one of you talk about opportunity districts? Is there a percentage that we hit or um, is, that, is that something that's more just sort of a, there's no, like a lot of this process, there's no real hard guidelines around it. We just, opportunity district is what we think it is or is there percentages or, or like, what does an opportunity district look like? An opportunity district is a district that provides minorities with an opportunity to elect their candidates of choice. Now, 
If you look across the country in some places like Arkansas, if that district isn't elect at least 55 or 60 percent black, it isn't going to elect a black candidate because black turnout is so depressed and there's virtually no white crossover. But in other areas like uh, Atlanta, Georgia or North Carolina, 45 percent is enough because there's enough because black voters are turning out in high amounts and there's enough white crossovers. So it isn't a target. It is um, you do look at the the demographics to some degree because even a district that's say 10 percent black might elect a black preferred candidate, but it isn't electing a black preferred candidate because of black voters. So you have to have a significant black population, but it comes down to is the district able to elect the minority preferred candidate? So it's a functional analysis. It's district specific. You're going to look at districts by district because in some areas it might be easier to elect a minority preferred candidate and the percentage might be lower, say 40%. In other areas it might be more difficult and you might need 50%. So it's, there's no demographic target. It's a, a look at recompiled election results, is what we call it. Does the minority preferred candidate carry the proposed district? So, so, and it's just black and white population. It's got nothing to do with uh, other race. Like, so my district is 63% not white. So that, that coalition, we can't, you don't look at that coalition. It's, it's just number of black voters in there or again another another point that's totally subjective no not not totally subjective at all so if blacks and hispanics are cohesive in support of the minority preferred candidates then you can consider the group as a coalition district um, but if they're not cohesive, then you look at one group or the other. You look at black voters or you look at Hispanic voters. But if they're voting the same, then it's a, you can create a coalition district. So the voting patterns is what dictates whether or not the district is what you would call a coalition district. It's not the demographics, it's the voting patterns. Thank you. And, and do you do this around the country? Do you analyze... Um maps and redistricting around the country? I do it around the world, as a matter of fact. I do it around the country, both for jurisdictions, and I also work as an expert witness in voting rights cases within the courts. And, and how long does a typical redistricting process last? <laughs> do you like that question? I think um, I, I, I am cognizant of the time, and one of my colleagues still has a question. Councillor Baker, do you, um, we could That's have... my last question, if they yeah. can answer that. Well, that really varies. Uh, usually, when I work with a government, I look at their deadline or when the next election process begins, and then working backwards, unless there's a, uh, a law that requires a deadline, you want to make sure that your plan is enacted with enough time to implement it with your local elections authorities, usually to wrap up a process uh, at least three weeks to a month before the petitioning starts. But having said that, it's never too early to start. It's sometimes too late to catch up. Might be the best way of putting it. Thank you. Councillor Louis Jean. Yes, just three quick points. The first being that the, around the questions of whether or not there's a current voting rights uh, a VRA um, compliance or uh, a potential violation, oftentimes those are actually hard to determine until you get a plaintiff who brings an alternative map to show that there is a Voting Rights Act, um, Act violation because an alternative map could have been drawn that would have given minority voters the effective ability to elect the candidate of their choice. So I, I, I do personally, just as a lawyer, think that it's premature to make determinations regarding the VRA. Second is just to confirm something that the doctor had stated. It's really important when we're talking about this, and people have mentioned different elections, that the most important elections are the municipal elections. Those are considered the endogenous elections that are similar. That includes the at-large races, which is why Council Bach yesterday included data around the at-large races. That includes the municipal elections. You look at those endogenous races because those are the most determinative. Those are the most that way you can really pull comparisons and draw data from compared to exogenous races that we're talking about, which include the attorney general's race, which include any other race that's not in a municipal off your election. And then third, 
Um, a lot has been brought into this chambers that I think are red herrings and don't matter about, oh, like how I did in my race or, you know, I'm a, a, a white elected official and, and black voters voted for me. I was able to build coalitions. Like the test, again, must start with the voter and determine whether the racially polarized voting existed. And I think everything else, um, I'm a first time candidate and I did really well in my first time coming out the gate. That is not going to tell you anything unless you look at the data and look at voting patterns and see how people voted across the city. There are certain neighborhoods where you could probably determine that there was racially polarized voting in my race because of who voted for me and who didn't. That doesn't mean that I didn't succeed as a candidate, but that there means that there are, that there is indicia in my election of some form of racially polarized voting. So you can have the best campaign you want, you can be a coalition builder you all you want, and there are reasons why the Voting Rights Act exists, and it's because a lot of folks, unfortunately, still contend with bias and, are, and, 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 and vote on racial lines. And so if that were not the case, we wouldn't have the Voting Rights Act, and we wouldn't need to ensure that candidates, that communities of color are able to elect the candidate of their choice. So I just want to call out how unimportant a lot of that information that's been brought to the floor is. If I could just add to that, I agree with you, but one of the benefits of having the racial voting analysis done at the front end hopefully avoids litigation. Uh, Dr. Hanley and I worked together uh, in several Massachusetts State Senate redistricting cycles, and we're able to do the analysis up front to avoid uh, any challenges to the plan. In fact, 20 years ago, when we did analysis on the State Senate, it was not done in the State House. And as many of you probably know, uh, the State House lost the Voting Rights Act lawsuit because uh, of the mistakes it made. But we avoided that by doing front end analysis, such as we're doing now, to avoid the litigation. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a while across the country, too. And it's it was a major challenge to get uh, the incumbent governments or commissions drawing plans to do this kind of work up front to avoid litigation. Now, you, you can't prevent litigation, but the chances of uh, making sure your plan is legally airtight is all the much greater by doing this kind of work now. So yeah, we're I glad to be able to be of service. Yeah, and my response was based on the proposed maps, which right. which my understanding is that the VR, your VRA response was not in response to these maps. You were talking about the districts as they currently exist. I'm talking about the premature right. making right. Right. on the proposed it, plans. It's our hope that we can take a look at a limited number of plans uh, before they're sent to the mayor so that you can be assured that what you've done is the right thing, but we're not at that point yet. Thank you. Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I just wondered while we have them um, here, uh, if um, Dr. Henley, you can speak just because uh, District 3 has been a particular um, point of discussion for us, if you can speak to the polarization in the 2021 general there, and then also just maybe um, clarify again for councillors what the kind of the percent number polarized means. That's not right. Okay, so in 2021, we had a <coughs> contest in District 3. Um, again, you'll get the table, but go into more detail, but this was a contest that included two white candidates, and the white voters, Hispanic voters, and Asian voters supported the incumbent, uh, and black voters supported the challenger, Stephen McBride. So that contest was polarized. The uh, black preferred candidate lost that contest. Um, the candidate preferred by white voters, Hispanic voters, and Asian voters won that contest. Now, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I have to actually leave. I'm so sorry, but I uh, have a 12 o'clock that I have to go to. Uh, did I answer that question? I think we, we might submit a, a question in writing to follow up from co um, colleagues. I am, we really appreciate you, the time this morning and we want to respect your, 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 your hard stop at 12. So thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Handley. And thank you. Um, does attorney uh, Weiss, is he able to stay on? I can stay on a little bit longer, but I am not going to be able to really answer any of the uh, an analytical questions since Dr. Hanley did the actual work. I could discuss a few legal questions with you. Very good. Well, if you're able to stay on, we'd appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Hanley. 
You're welcome. Bye. Um, Councillor Flynn, you had a question. Yes, thank you. And my question is to the to the to uh, Attorney Weiss. We're we're probably or likely voting tomorrow on redistricting, but would you in in the doctor be able to turn around some of these questions we have by the end of the day tomorrow? So I mean, at the end of the day today, so we're able to review some of the um, questions and answers. Well, Dr. Hanley and I discussed that question earlier today. The sooner you can get a map um, for her to review, the sooner she can get a, an analysis back. That's the, probably the best I could say. Do, do we, are we giving you enough time to review the data, give us giving, giving uh, uh, that, appropriate answers, but is that enough time for you to turn it around? I think, I can't speak for Dr. Hanley, but I believe she can, you know, probably work on one map today. But again, uh, that's just based on our conversation. If you get her a map, the sooner the better. It's now noon. If you can get a map to her this afternoon, uh, she, you know, I would say she hopefully would be able to do that. Yeah, we, we, have, we have about five maps at least. No, we'll be only submitting one map. We will be yeah. offering a, a map, the last yeah. final map we will be offering Which, for I mean, analysis. I mean, given that all of the maps right now, you know, don't seem to have major problems with them and based on the, I think the guidance, the suggestions that we've discussed in the last hour, uh, if you can agree on a map that uh, does not, from your estimations, overly pack a district with minority voters, nor uh, take too many voters out of a district, if you can keep some balance, a semblance uh, somewhat akin to what you have now, uh, you know, that's a map we can look at. And I think Dr. Hanley's analysis, if there's a problem there, could be something that you might be able to remedy uh, in a very short period of time. Thank you, sir. None of the none of the plans that we've seen are outrageously don't raise the red flags that we can say you know plans two three and four are a problem don't go there but we're looking at modifying the district you know the maps you have now yes that's correct we're, we'll be making some minor adjustments to the, the the maps that we have now the one map that the the um a Royal Braden map is the map that we're working off and we'll be making some uh, some, some adjustments to that this afternoon. Yeah, I mean, we will do our best to make sure that whatever plan you're looking at and voting on, we can give you the best analysis to ensure that this plan you know, would be uh, considered by the mayor and to hopefully avoid any litigation. That's the goal. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Murphy, you had a question? Yes. Um, so on the maps, I had submitted a map over a month ago now. I think it's time's going slow or fast. But, and my map was a good attempt, which it did at getting the population for all nine districts close to that target. The deviation is about 2%. But also um, filed it through the council because um, a, a map had been filed previously, and I was told that that would be the best way to bring it to the council, to the floor, to this body. Three maps were filed since then, so now we have five maps. But only yesterday, in a working session, did we begin, but we haven't really started to take a look at any one map as the base map and then start to move precincts and talk through any of them. So I know when there's reference to, I can speak to my map, that that was in no way, a, this is, I've done all the work in a silo on my own. It was, okay, why don't we as a body work on this map as a starting point? So if you were to look at all of the maps now, none of the changes have been made yet. So I'm concerned that You'd be spending time on maps that we haven't talked through in each district councillor and at-large councillor weighing in on, is this a good, is this right? What about these communities of interest? Which precinct's that? Which neighborhood are we cutting up? Which neighborhood are we keeping safe? So, I mean, I just feel like we're far away from a map. Maybe there's seven votes 
in this body, but far away from us working through anything where we all feel confident that we've had a say in and advocated for what we're hearing from our communities yet. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, any one more question for, for Attorney Weiss? Is that um, Councillor Flaherty? One more question. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and obviously thank you to the attorney. You had mentioned a few minutes ago to Attorney Weiss that um, obviously focusing on not packing as well as not moving too many voters out of a district. Are those sort of the two criteria where uh, we would invite litigation? And, and, I, and I ask that because I've repeatedly asked my colleagues throughout the process to try to sharpen their pencils and try to, um, I guess, uh, reduce right. the number of reduce the number of precincts that are changing districts, if you will. So. I just heard your reference focusing on not packing and as well as right. we're not, not moving too many voters out of a particular district. Is that, are those principles uh, we should be wise to follow? Those are, the, those are the most important ones. From what I've seen so far, you're not drawing non-contiguous districts. You're not drawing non-compact districts. And to the extent possible, you're probably observing neighborhood boundaries. So I don't see any uh, city charter issues right now. But the big ones are the Voting Rights Act, and uh, the 14th Amendment, either not taking a, any one district with polarized voting low to the point where you're going to dilute minority voting strength and cause a uh, Voting Rights Act violation to occur. That would be where the minority voters can no longer elect their preferred candidate of choice. And then on the flip side, you don't want to take a current district's minority population and unnecessarily cherry pick adding additional population uh, where you don't have to. Very good. And I think there's a lot of cherry picking in some of these maps, Attorney Weiss, but I appreciate your comments. And yeah, I mean, the, the Supreme Court, uh, going back 30 some odd years ago, uh, held that a district that followed an interstate highway in North Carolina that added black voters uh, all along the east and west side of the, uh, of the corridor, that that was, um, uh, that, that shapes mattered and that when it comes to race, you cannot draw districts based on race unless you are looking to remedy a vote dilution issue. Uh, the only other way you can really draw a minority district purposefully is if there's simply a naturally occurring you know, community or neighborhood of interest that might be square or round or regularly shaped that's very compact. And population numbers may also require that. But you want to avoid deliberately uh, picking uh, minority voters uh, based on race and also being cognizant that uh, not all race, uh, uh, voters of, of color vote the same way. Thank you, Attorney. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Weiss. Okay. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you for okay. your time this morning. Okay. okay. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Um, So um, let's move on. Uh, it was really valuable to have our um, expert, um, subject matter experts with us this morning. Um, I think moving on, uh, we have, um, we have until about 1.30, so we have an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, there's another hearing in this chamber this afternoon. Um, I'd like to um, ask, um, Councillor Mejia, beg your pardon, you had, um, you had a, a comment. Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask if we were going to move into trying to look at what changes we need to make and having a conversation, because I know I've been participating in every single conversation that we've had. I even actually canceled an opportunity that I had to speak overseas to be here throughout this entire process. So I know we have been doing the work. Um, and so to hear that we have not, I just, I just wanna rebuttal that. That is not the case because we have been working really hard to get to a good place. And I'd like to be able to utilize the last hour and 30 minutes that we have left to 
see where we're moving. Thank and you. Keep it moving. Thanks. Thank you. As we start a conversation about uh, changes to a map, um, we're going to have uh, bring up the, the district our uh, map to work off, and then we will um, look at the proposed amendments to that map and have a conversation. Uh, if anyone would like to take a five minute recess for a, a physiological break, we'll be back here at. Um, we'll just go through? Okay, well, I'll keep talking and we'll have our folks. Um, okay, oh, that's right. Um, okay, Councillor Baker. Um, how, did, how did the committee come up with the decision to use a map? as a jumping off point when we worked on a, what we call the base map, and we haven't even seen that. We, like, who, who came up with that decision? You on your own, unilaterally? Uh, uh, because the reason why I ask is, um, I'm 10 or 12 moves in the rear here to try and be made whole, so it doesn't seem fair to, to uh, District the, 3. We're, we're working off the Braden Arroyo map, and it was an evolution out of the Braden Worrell map. And this map, the, the, the Braden Arroyo map, incorporated some of the suggestions of you yourself and Councillor Murphy. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, and we are about to discuss further amendments to that map, so, given the feedback that we've had from community members and advocates and colleagues. We are, we are proposing some amendments to that map to make it uh, make it uh, achieve the goals that we're setting out to, to make, uh, you know, uh, more um, effective opportunities for communities of color to elect the candidate of their choice. So that wasn't a committee decision? It was a decision by the chair and in consultation, yeah, it was a decision by the chair. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it is, and it has evolved, I have to say, that there's a, there's a paper trail about the, the conversations we've had right out from, from uh, all the different iterations of the maps that oh, we've yeah. looked at. I'm sure it was amazing. Thank you. Anyone else? And Dr. Um, Councillor Royal, um, would you like to speak to the proposed amendments to the Braden Royal map? And um, Wayne's trying to get it up on the districter, but we can, we can get started. And if he gets it on the districter, will it go on the screen so people can see it? Correct. Yes? Okay. Thank you, Shane. Uh, and thank you to central staff for everything you've, you've been doing. So taking into account some of the stuff that we've heard uh, both from uh, the counselor from District 3 and from the general aspects of sort of feedback that we've heard about uh, the ability to, to do effective choice and some of the concerns people have lifted, I believe it's appropriate and would make good sense to take 17.2 and 17.6 that are currently uh, on the Braden Arroyo map going to District 3 and return them to District 4 so they no longer change and then to give 16.9 back to District 3 and by my calculations and, and I was, I've been doing this uh, on the numbers that we have I believe that that change works. It increases, uh, it takes uh, Council Worrell from about 14 something percent uh, white vote in his district to, it, it keeps it at a, it's still in the ballpark, it's at like 12-4 or something like that. Um, and it, it does do some of the, some of the response we received about these precincts in general. I think it answers the questions that I've heard other councilors raise about voting preferences uh, and ensuring effective choice. I think it also answers some of the neighborhood specific concerns around Codman Square, 
around some of those 16s, I think it's a step in the right direction. And so that, that's an offer, I think, that makes sense to consider uh, on whatever final map is proposed. Thank you. Any, any comments or questions on that? Councillor Murphy? Um, Council um, Arroyo, if I heard you correctly, I just want to make it clear that 16.9 and 16.5 is a very tight neighborhood community around the parish of St. Anne's, Neponset. That is Neponset. So 16.9 and 5 should stay together in Neponset. 16. Does it? Well, let me see. I can't see them. Hold on. We need them up. We will. Wynn is putting them up on the screen because the folks in the in the the in, in attendance need to see it as well. What's the number? Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you for your help with this. I can't see. I'm sorry. I know, but they're too small. I can't see those. Do we have the big maps that Shane had in the other I think room? every number of the capital. Can we look at those too? To I think every member yeah. of the capital. Thank you. Nine seven five, right up through before you hit Fields Corner. Eight six and four are on the other side of Adam Street. Nine and seven are behind St. Anne's Church on the Ponset Ave. So, just to answer that question, you were talking about sixteen five and sixteen seven, which I see directly above sixteen nine. Yeah, in sixteen nine, right. but were you saying that you would? So, what I would propose yep. is giving sixteen nine yep. back to District Three, so unifying what you just talked about. Yep. And then taking seventeen six and seventeen two, which currently are slated to go there. They are seventeen six and seventeen two are currently okay. slated to go into D three. They would remain with District Four. And I think this answers to the concern you just raised about those communities, but also the concerns other people have raised about effective ability uh, to create effective choice in District 4 as well as District 3. And so I think this is something that I would hope everybody could agree to because I think it's a step in the right direction. I would also note that this is... Uh, Councillor Bach had put together some suggestions yesterday, and I believe this is actually pretty much exactly that. I don't have it directly in front of me, but it's very much in line with what was presented on this side of the map. And so I think that is a uh, place where I hope we can find compromise all the way around because it does put 16.9 back with 16.7 and 16.5, and it, it does reunify to some extent Codman Square. But it does corners. split um, Adams Corner right up Adams Street between eight and nine. So you're saying eight, 11, and 12 stay in four? On but this, nine pulls on this out. Proposal, yes, on this proposal, nine goes out and rejoins seven and, and five. And this is this is just an opening, I think, thing where we can sort of all agree to to this move. Obviously, people might want to go further. Some people might disagree with that. But I think this is a way to to start moving in a place of consensus. Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just taking that um, overture. Uh, can we consider 16.8, 16.11, and 16.12 and unifying that neighborhood that was initially taken out? And what would that look like? And then what would need to come out if those come in to District 3? 16.8, 11, and 12. So I will tell you that my, my, we've talked about this a lot about unpacking and effective districts as opposed to pack districts. And part of what this, I hope, does is it removes the idea that we are, remo we are, which I think, you know, I don't know how, how much I fully agree with the idea that District 4 was no longer able to make effective choice, but I think that this puts to bed the idea that they can't make an effective choice or be an effective district um, if you make these moves. The issue is if you don't give District 4 
16, 8, 16, 11, those, those in that vicinity that are remaining in, it, in this proposal, then they are, in my opinion, packing based on the definitions that we got uh, on Friday from uh, Dr. Moon uh, of effective choice and sort of everything over what it takes to do effective choice is technically packing. And so I think this, this unpacks, it, it diversifies District 4 a little bit more, but I do think that this sort of overture of 17-2, 17-6 in exchange for leaving 16-9 in District 3 is something that I feel like we can all build sort of common consensus on. Some people might want to go much further. Some people might not want to do that at all. I don't know. It's not like, you know, it's on the floor now for the first time. Uh, but I do think it's something that we can find agreement on. And then there's other places where people are going to disagree, and that's fine. But I do think this is a place of agreement. Thank you. Um, can you, uh, other suggestions that we had? Um... Yeah, if you can go up really quick to the South Boston part of this. Uh, and I would defer this to, to other folks as well. But 6-3, it's my understanding that 6-3 and 6-2 split uh, the D Street housing. Is that, is that an accurate understanding for my... So what I would do is take 6-3. This, this would be my suggestion. If you take 6-3 and paint that yellow, which puts 6-3 back in 6 in 6-2, back together and put put 315 in district 3 which is the ink block for folks that are trying to figure out what that number means you at least in this version you you take out less south boston but it for the specific reason of unifying 62 and 63 which has the d street housing i've heard about 7576 this is um in 7-4, and the reason I say 7-4 is because the Ann Lynch homes, the way that these precincts are current, I don't know if we can zoom in more. Ann Lynch was if we can get all the way to the street level. And then zoom, yep, perfect. If you look at, uh, and if you could just get it so that 7-7 seven, seven is also in that. There you go. It's my opinion that Ann Lynch Homes and the McCormick Homes have a lot in common. Uh, in fact, they share Moakley Park. They can look at each other from directly across the street. They're both affordable housing complexes. Uh, and the Ann Lynch Homes right now are split between three precincts because of the way these precincts are cut, which gets us back to eventually we gotta look at these precincts and how they're cut. But the Ann Lynch Homes are split between seven, six, seven, five, and seven, four. Uh, that tiny little, if you can zoom in all the way to that little like box that goes into 7-4, like that little corner between 7-6 and 7-4, that is where that's, that split sort of happens right there. But the vast majority, like over 90% of that complex is in 7-5 and 7-6. I actually believe they have common cause with 7-7. So if in this version, if you go back, if in this version, 7-7 seven, seven stays in District 3, I think it makes a lot of sense for the BHA housing in 7-5 and 7-6, which is the Enlich Homes, to be unified with them. Now, there's a, there's a world where I had presented them staying unified the other way because I think they share common cause. But I do believe that this works, at least as a preliminary, I, I think in terms of folks who have issues with this map, the, the changing of... 6-3 for 315 is a step in the direction that I think they can agree with. I, I personally think that the Ann Lynch homes have a lot of organizing and um, shared interest with the, the McCormick housing, and I've heard that from multiple counselors at different times. But what I am suggesting is not to touch that part of it, at least it's not my suggestion here, but to take the 6-3 precinct above it because it splits the D Street housing with 6-2 and just make that swap right now of 6-3 for 315. And if you go to the population deviation really quick, you'll notice that it keeps the population deviation in line. And then if you do the evaluation, from a racial demographic standpoint, it also does what I consider uh, quite a bit to ensure that if you're looking at it from uh, what we've heard today about racially polarized voting or all of those different things that you're still allowing 
District 3 on this variation to create or to have effective choice for a candidate of their choosing. Um, again, I don't think that the process, and I think legally the process, is not to make it so that a district will elect a person of color. There's no, that, that's not what this is. It is simply to make sure that those groups are able to have an effective voice on their choice of who they are electing. I think this, this straddles that line of making sure that District 3 is still doing that and that District 4 is able to do that. And I would just say from the definition of an opportunity district, District 3 is the opportunity district here, not District 2. And so it is making sure that that opportunity district is strengthened, not weakened. And I, I, don't, I haven't done a variation of this. I, I leave it to, to my peers. I have not seen a variation of this where if you take out 7576, you create an opportunity district unless you also sort of swap that out for 8-1 and 9-1. And I have heard very passionate opposition to that uh, by both uh, EBA by the Chinese Progressive Association, uh, and I believe, uh, though I'm not positive on this, I believe Council President Flynn has stated that they should stay together. I don't know if he has stated they should stay together with him. I know he has requested it. Um, but what I think, I don't know what the population demographics would look like, but that would be the only other way that you keep the racial demographics and sort of the opportunity district alive, I think, on this variation. So the one change I would make on this part is the 6-3 to the 315, because I think everybody would agree that they like that more. Even if they don't like everything else they're looking at, I think they would agree that the 6-3, 315 change is a step in the right direction. And then, you know, after that, it's, it's a lot of conversation from a lot of different people. But I leave that to the counselor from District 2 and, and other <laughs> interested parties. But I think those changes make it so that we don't have to run all over this map, making changes everywhere in every precinct. And they, they're a step in the right direction and then after that, folks can, can have it out about where they, what they think from one direction or another. But those are my suggestions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Councillor Flynn, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Flynn. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Council Royal. Maybe I'll, uh, um, so yeah, you are right, Council Royal. I, I propose that 8-1 and 9-1 would stay together communities of Colorado, Villa Victoria, West Dedham Street, which is the BHA development, and Cathedral BHA. So they should be, they should be aligned. I'm also, I also believe what, what those two precincts um, are important in any district, but I want to make sure that if there are if it, go, if it stays in District 2 or if, if it does go to another, another district, it is important that they stay together. That was my main, my main point during the discussion is 8-1, E and 9-1 stay together in, in be united in, in a district, obviously, but um, whatever my, my colleagues think um, based on what their experience is. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight, highlight that, Council Royal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, are you open or do you think that that just, obviously this isn't finalized in any way, shape, or form, but would you agree that 6-3 being put back in District 2 in exchange for 315 going into District 3 would work just on the surface level for you? Yes, I think 6-3 and 6-2 should be part of, and 6-1 should be part of District 2 in 315. As you mentioned, whether that would be in District Three, I, I think, or or another district, se seems to make sense to me. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Um, Wayne, could you um, please make some changes to see what happens here. If we were to restore 6, 8, 9, 11, 16, 8, 16, 9, 11, and 12 back to 3, and then keep 16, 1, and 3 together, but move it to 4, which then would mean 17, 6 would have to also um, go to 4 to be contiguous. What are we looking at? 
I'm sorry, 16-1 and 16-3 in Fields Corner. Keep those together, but move them to four. And then also 17-6, because that's next to 16-3. Up there, like 16-3 is Melville Ave. 17. And although the map I'm looking at might have already had changes, but I see that it has 16-3 and one. I think you did it right. I can't see from what you have. I can't tell if, can you see, Chair, if those change, I can't tell. 16, one, and three, put them together, but put them in four. And 17, six is four, yep. And that maybe will offset some of the population deviation. But what do we what do we have now? What do we? I, I can't. See. Not completely. It's restoring those four bottom and keeping. No, because one and three are separated right now. Frank, do you have 16-1 right now? No. You don't. So that already wasn't. So it would be combining. And what changes, what, what other changes happened to four? Like, what, what does four look like? I can't see the numbers. Can you read them, please, Wayne, for four? Um, yes, uh, Wayne, can you read the numbers for um, the, the demographic breakdown for race and district four uh, with these changes? Yes, so as it is right now on screen, it has district four for demographic breakdown 7.5% white, 82.7% mm -hmm. black. So it makes, it, it reduces the white population in district four significantly, like by one and a half percent or so? Yeah. But from here now, we're at a better starting point where District 3 isn't. No, well, the, this is, the whole idea is to try and ingre increase diversity in District 4 and then also increase the opportunity for a candidate, communities That's of color in District 3 to elect the candidates of their choice. So um, reducing the number of uh, white population in District 4 is certainly contrary. That would even be increasing the packing in District 4. So. Right, but then you can go a little further where you could go to the West, right? 19-7. And I've heard some of the advocates saying, I've been at all of these hearings where go West, so 4 is touching 19-7. If we were to add 19.7, what's the current population in four right now? Before you add 19.7? Wynne, can you read out the, the population? Yes, uh, so district four right now is 70,011 people. Right. So if you add 19.7 to district four, that raises it to right, 72,089. What is their demographic breakdown now? With uh, that raises it to 9%. Perfect, right? So now we're at 9%, which is... So 9% versus 14.8%? or Well, 14.8 completely tearing apart and breaking other voting right acts and 14th Amendment rights, right? So we are trying to come to some agreement Right, and working around. I mean, this is what we need to move things around to see. So I think we've increased the white population in District 4. And we've restored a community of interest and neighborhood in District 3. So, Councillor Baker, you had a comment, and then Councillor Mejia. Oh, beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. Uh, who was first? Councillor Bach. Councillor Baker, Councillor Mejia. Okay. Okay. Councillor Baker with that, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, to, this is back to Councillor Arroyo's amendments. Um, like, yeah, I, I would agree with, I would agree with all those amendments Councillor Arroyo proposed. So 17.6 and 17.2 back to D4, 16.9 back to D3, um, 
six three back to D two and then flipping three fifteen to D three. Um, I agree that all of those, I think, move us more in the direction of travel, um, just based on sort of the conversations that we've had. Um, I wanted to make one further transformation um, suggestion, um, which is that uh, if you, and this was reflected somewhat in my, in my comments yesterday, but um, if we flip four or five back to, counts to um, D7, which is where it is today, uh, so out of D2 into D7, then I think that allows us to flip um, 7.5 and 7.6, the old colony project, back to D2. Um, that does for the moment leave 6.10 sort of stranded out, attached to 6.1, but um, have you, sorry, I don't know, Wayne, if you're following me in real time or if. You mentioned, so Councilor Arroyo was saying 6-3. So I'm not undoing any of the, I'm saying, I'm saying on, I'm saying on top of the transformations, if you go to the, if you go to the map as amended by Councilor Arroyo just now, by his proposal. Yeah, so make 315. Sorry. District 3. Yes, so. Councilor Arroyo was saying 17-2, 17-6. Yeah, 17 to yeah, 17 6. Yeah, 16-9. Okay. Sorry, um, sorry. Uh, and then if you go up, he had, so then he had flipped, yeah, you've already flipped three back, but you need to flip th three, um, 315 okay. to, was his last suggestion. And fuck, okay. So wait, just tell me so I can double check. Is that, um, what's the, that what's the number of people in, in D2 in that? Um, right now it is 74,528. In D2. In D2. Okay. And let me just double check that that's... Huh. Why is that not the same as... Oh, because you already flipped. You already flipped. Sorry. Can you undo my flip of 4 or 5 just so that we can start from the same place? Yes. So go back to... So undo that one. <clears throat> just so that... So that's where... That's, I think, where Councillor Arroyo left the map. Right. 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 Um, and what number, what, but what number is D2 at in that? 77,466. Damn it. Why? This is like very not. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Bach, did you mention 310? No, no, I didn't say anything okay. about 310. Um, okay, yeah, I'm in, so now I'm in the right map. Um, so, okay, so 77,466. Is yes, okay. for District 2. Great. So from here, which reflects Councillor Arroyo's proposed amendments, which like I'm agreeing with, you then additionally flip. And um, actually, if you, uh, yeah. So then what you additionally do is flip 4-5 um, back to District 7. OK. OK. And then you go over and you flip 7-5 and 7-6 back to. Right here, 7-5, 7-6. Yeah, but then there's something that I must have moved because <laughs> that has, uh, oh no, it's sorry, it's sorry. That one should still have 6-10 because Councillor Arroyo did, left 6-10 in. No, we don't have 6-10 in it. You didn't you, on the base map on the on the as Braden, filed. Yeah, the Braden Royal map as filed. Oh, as, as filed. As okay, okay. So you're okay. Sorry. So I had I had misunderstood. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess um, then give me a second to look at it. So I guess the thing is, you either have to add six ten, which is kind of awkward, or find one more precinct to flip into D three there because D three is a bit low. Um, but I think that I, th I think there's a number of options there. I guess the point would stand that I think I think it would make good sense to go back to keeping four five and D seven, and that would put us on a path to managing to keep the old colony um, housing development in D two. So, and then the other thing that I think is worth flagging with those changes um, is that with the without those changes, I think that you know the one sort of like like a loss, as it were, when you think about an opportunity district, is that the um, the the map as amended with Councilor Arroyo's amendments floats in D three back up from like 
it, it floats from 36% white to 38.1% white. Um, and when you make these flips, you're bringing it back down into the 36 area. So I think from the D3 opportunity map project perspective, it would be useful to make a switch like that. But let me look a little bit at, I mean, I guess one thing would be to add 610, um, or you could grab another one of the, of the okay. edge precincts with D4. 610 to District 3, that would make the District 2 population 76,779, District 1, 71,034. Right, so that, and that would put you, like, you know, inside of the overall um, swing, and then that, what that does is it, uh, yeah, it moves some, um, your, your overall, uh, it, it lower, that lowers your, um, your total, like, white population in D3 a bit, um, but it would lower it more if the precinct that we added were, uh, were a less white precinct than 610, if that makes sense, but I'll play with it a little bit. If I so I don't want to jump in front Councilor, of Councillor Baker, but I do want to address sort of some of the changes that were made to me. But if Councillor Baker would like to go first, thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh, so if you could just do, if you could take sixteen ten out of that, flip back seven five seven six, which is part of the original proposal. Uh, and I know that this helps the deviation pretty substantially, but four five in in the original version is back in District Two, and I just want to touch on why I think on my original map. Uh, it was also uh, the Fernandez Anderson map, it was also there uh, and has consistently stayed there. If you can go to the evaluation when you do this and then flip back four or five. Four or five. You can see that with four or five in District 7, the effective black population is uh, around 33%. It takes it a whole percentage per choice, but that's not the only reason. If you can go to the magnifying glass and you go to four or five, it has a significant Asian population, uh, which is in line with uh, eight one and nine one. And so I actually was trying originally to keep the Asian population uh, that is very connected to Chinatown and the CPA. If we were going to give eight one nine one to somebody else, it was my belief that you should unite 8191 and 45. The way we originally did that was through giving all of that to District 3. The way that it works now, 45 being part of District 2, increases the Asian population, puts them in line with the South End uh, Asian population, because it's, it's, my understanding is it's also similar ethnicities uh, and similar common cause. And then you still keep uh, doing that, keeps District 7 around 35% black, where they have had a number of, uh, it's been well reported by the Globe, they've lost a large amount of their black population, so that's kind of a feat in and of itself. But it also uh, ensures that we're not weakening District 7 in any way, but instead enhancing the voice of that Asian population within District 2. Um, one of the concerns I have with this is if you do even this version, you'll see that in District 3, uh, and just to be clear with folks who are watching this, and District R doesn't have the exact numbers because they do an interesting thing with mixed race, but it's probably closer to about 18% in District 3. Thank you, Siri. It's probably closer to 18% in District 3 on black population on this map, but I worry that if we start to add 610, if you put a magnifying glass over 610, that's uh, very not diverse uh, by almost every definition. And it would make it, it, it would, so if you take 7576 out just right now, obviously this isn't gonna match because you're gonna find different places to put it, right, if you did this. But if you take 7576 out and then you just threw in 7, 610, uh, 61 is already in there, it's the connector. But if you throw in 610 and then go to evaluation, you're already going to have to make up this population somewhere. You can do it a number of different ways. You can go 7-3, 7-1. I think there's been a lot of conversation about, from different folks about why that wouldn't work, would, would work. What I would present it, and again, I'm just one individual, this is a body, but if you take 6-10 back and you put 7-3, 7-5, 6 together, I think at a minimum this allows for more map cohesion and, 
and it's defensible to me from a compactness standpoint. Now, people can have different opinions on how we can do this without necessarily doing 7576, and I, and I think they will, but I still think that this is the one that causes the, less, the least amount of disruption while still staying true to what we have to do from a number of different levels. It seems to me to move out 7675 without having like a concrete solid home and just sort of piecemealing it creates dilemmas, and that's my biggest concern. Thank you, Councillor Royal. Councillor Baker, did you have a, no, a, a, a Councillor Bach, and then uh, Councillor Flaherty? Oh, sorry, Can, Councillor sorry. Bach, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Flaherty. Okay, so sorry. So I would just say a couple of things. One thing is that I think on a micro community level, it's really important to know that for four eight has. Um, You've basically got the Symphony East, Symphony West there. So, you know, I think that when I think about how folks actually organize around there, keeping Symphony East and West together, which you would do if you keep 4-5 and D7, is important. Um, and, and, and I think it's, uh, yeah. So for me, the sort of community of interest arguments cut in that direction. Um, I also think that, you know, and again, using Districtor as a rough thing, right, but the I think the 33.4 that it puts the black pop in, count in D7 um, is the same as the current D7, so it's not making it less um, black. And then if you go over, I think, so a suggestion, for instance, I'd make, because I take your point, I mean, I think, like, if you took, for instance, 15.2 um, from District 4 and moved it to District 3, uh, then you would balance things out, and I think, you know, I think it's really substantial if we go from, uh, if we go like in that in that situation, we're talking about a you know a 35.6 white district three, as opposed to with just the Arroyo transformations, we're at a 38.1. So that's like a quite a substantial increase in the coalition of color in in um, district three. So that's that's my gut, and it's always I think been a challenge about making up population in district three when you're talking about an opportunity district that outside of the public housing. Um, which both those precincts seven six and seven five include, um, like you know they're very white, obviously. So um, just in terms of places that you can pick up things that notch you towards opportunity. If, if I could just reply to this, and I, I do unfortunately have another commitment I'm have to go to. So if you go up, unfortunately, if you go up, right? This is the one uh, major part of this that I like want to make clear. We do have communities of interest, that, and we also have what are clearly defined by law opportunity districts. Those include District 5, District 4, District 3, District 7. Those are majority minority districts. The reality is it's our role to strengthen District 7, strengthen District 3. You're supposed to be strengthening the opportunity districts. Under the standpoint of that framework, and this is really, and I'm just gonna put it out there, this is really different because in District 2 you have sort of voting patterns that are very different even though you don't have the same racial diversity that you have. You do have communities as a whole are voting in a different way, right? The South End doesn't always vote in, in alignment with South Boston. I think everybody knows that. But it's not technically an opportunity district. And so our, our mandate is to strengthen opportunity districts, which is why, if anything, District 7 should be getting more people of color. It should not be decreasing or staying equal. Same thing with District 3, same thing with District 5, same thing with District 4 in, in the sense that up to where it's packing, it's a problem. But you're supposed to be strengthening the opportunity districts. And my concern here is that we're moving things around in a non-opportunity district in a way that doesn't strengthen actual opportunity districts. And that is our overarching mandate. And so I would be opposed just openly to anything that I think weakens opportunity districts in District 7 and District 3 and District 5 and District 4 beyond what I consider excess. And, and, that's, and that's my concern. And I just want to stress that the original map, right, that you filed is at 35.9. I get it. And then it goes to 38.1 with the amendments and it comes back down to 35.6 with my amendments. So I think there's a real question of how to make D3 the maximal opportunity district, and I, I agree with your points about the framing here, but I think that you can do that without harm. Yeah, and I would just say my original map sent District 7 into 7, 10, 13, 5, and 15, 1, because its objective was to make sure that we were adding people of color in a sustainable way. It didn't leave it this way. Sorry, my, my apologies. I meant, I meant the prior, I meant the original filed NAACP map. 
Like, I mean that, that map. The, you mean the, the, the I mean Arroyo Braden, right, is at 35.9%. No, I get it. I get it. And then you go up to 38.1, and if you do this, you come back to 356 and I think that you're really holding District 7 harmless in that situation. But that's, you know. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's subjective. But that's, that's what I'm, and I also just think from a community of interest standpoint, to be clear, you are correct on Symphony Towers. What it is in 4-8, uh, uh, but 4-8 has like 6,000 people in that precinct. And so there's no right. way to flip it's it. a bunch it. of students. Yeah, but it, they don't vote, but they're literally, it's a population we're using. And so 4-8 and 4-5, do have that shared common interest, but it is very obvious in the way that they organize that four or five does organize with the South End, with Chinatown collectively, just like four eight does. And this is a way to both make sure that we are keeping the numbers in District Seven where they have to be, while giving a community of interest the ability to advocate in shared cause. And I just want to make sure that as we do this, we don't get to a place where we're prioritizing how District Two looks when really the mandate on this is making sure that District 7, District 4, District 5, District 3 remain as strengthened as we can from an opportunity district standpoint. Um, and that's it, that's all I got. Everybody else can sort of thank do their thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Royal, Councilor Baker. And then thank we have you. Councilor Flaherty and, and Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've never felt so popular in my life, everybody talking about my district. Thank you so much. It, what, Priscilla, what did you call it, the um, District 3 project? Is that what this is, the District 3 project? Councilor how do Baker, we, can you how please? Do we make, uh, how do we make District 3 as disjointed as we possibly can? That's what it looks like to me. Um, so every, uh, despite my advocacy, despite bringing multiple people in here to talk about how we are a community and we would like to stay together, obviously fell on deaf ears across the, across the board here in this chamber. I'd like to thank you very much. Um, we're definitely not ready for a vote tomorrow, but let's plow right ahead with it. Definitely not ready for a vote. Um, as, as the advocate map indicates and through everyone's talking points throughout this process, it's evident to me that the goal is to split up the southeastern part of District 3. If this is the intent to not keep our current City Council District compact, to not preserve our neighborhoods, and to not keep our entire community of interest intact, including parish boundaries which are neighborhoods and neighborhoods are a factor, then my suggestion would be to send the entire upper, upper 16, 16, 8, 16, 9, 16, 11, and 16, 12, along with 17, 13, into District 4. This would keep that community together. In order to make the numbers right, District 3 would have to expand north into South Boston. Therefore, my suggestions to stay away from the housing developments would be to give 7, 1, 7, 2, and 7, 3 to District 3. By adding the above mentioned, along with 16-1 and 16-3 in Fields Corner, as well as 316 in the South End, it bridges District 3 population to 74,429 in line with the requirements. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Baker, would you mind repeating the precinct numbers? Okay. Put all of, put all of six, 16, 8, 16, 9, 16, 11, and 16, 12, along with 17, 13, which I think is the advocate map. Put that in, put that in District 4, and then move from District 2 to District 3, 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, and then add, we already did 16, 1, and 16, 3, and then add 3, 16 also. Sorry, seven one seven two seven three from District Two to District Three. Yep. And then, oh, back down. And then three sixteen in the South End. And I think three sixteen or three fifteen, a similar in population, you could do either one of those. Okay. Sixteen one sixteen three in District. In, in and I believe in our rush in our rush. We we're only talking about race in this one. We're not, we're not really talking about districts and, and how they should be working towards common goals, commonality. This district that, that you guys are all forcing on District 3 is laughable, I think. I, I'm looking for some commonality. I'm looking for where, where we're going to work, what we're, what we're going to do. 
looking for it, all disjointed. So, when can you read out the the analysis the, of the population analysis? For Sorry, this I made those changes that Councillor Baker read from the map as filed. Sorry. Was there anything from here? No. Oh, okay. No. So returning. Return to the, the original map, the so, advocate map. So those six yeah, one. Eight two is with me. Eight two is in district three. Right. It's seven one seven two seven three in district three. Yeah. Um, let me put the current district lines. There we go. Oh wait, so yeah, I don't come up to the S right. Oh yeah, three fifteen is right there. Add three fifteen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Add three fifteen. Three sixteen is what I get to add there. Is that three sixteen? Oh, adding three sixteen. Yeah, and take three fifteen out. Uh, three fifteen instead of three sixteen. To the yellow. Got it. Does that look right? Seventy-four thousand seven hundred forty-nine for district. And everybody's within. Everybody's within the, the requirements. And what does the, what does the ratio breakdown look like? That's the only thing I don't know. What's the demographic analysis, Wynn, um, if you don't mind? Uh, for District Four, it has fourteen point eight percent white, forty-nine point three percent black, twenty. 3.4% Hispanic. Uh, District 3 with 37.8% white, 18.9% black, 16% Hispanic. Uh, District 2, 64.6% .6 white, 5.3% black, 9.3% Hispanic. I'll swap out Asian. It has District 2 with 17% Asian, District 3 with 16.7% Asian, and District 4 with 3.6% Asian. Thank you. Leaves housing developments alone intact, keeps communities together. The communities that you guys all fought so hard to take from District 3 is now would be together in District 4. Can you scroll up to see, so we see the whole totality win? What precincts, uh, the existing districts, what precincts moved over to District 4? So here are the current districts. The precincts that would go to District 4 are 168, 16, 9, 16, 11, 16, 12, 17, 13. Going into District 3 from District 4, 16, 1, 16, 3, 17, 2, 17, 6. From District 2 to District 3, 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, 16, or 3, 16. Thank you. Yes. Councillor um, Flaherty. You have Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate if we can, Wayne, if we can get a printout of that. And then I just had a couple suggestions here, or at least if I can just um, plug and play some precincts. So, Wayne, if we can um, hit the reset button and down in Dorchester, if we could put 16, 8, 16, 9, 16, 11, and 16, 12 in District 3 with 17, 13 in District 4. Sorry, 16, 8. 8, 9, 11, and 12. 8, 9, 11, 12 eight, in District 3. Three, right? 7, 13 stays there. Scroll up. Scroll up and put uh, 6, 1. 6, 1. 6, 3. 7, 5, 7, 6 in D2. Put 315, 
8191 in D3. 315-8191? Correct. Possibly, um, three, possibly 316, I guess they probably get numbers up, right? W add 316? No, actually no, because that, put, that puts them over 80. And then scroll down. And then say 16, 3, and 17, 6 go into D4. And 17, 2. Can you scroll back up again? Hey, can you give me the? Can you just give me the racial breakdown of that? I know uh, we get we need some more numbers for D four, but I just want to get a breakdown. Do we have the racial breakdown on that one? Yes. Yeah. So right now it is at District two, sixty eight point nine percent white, four point three percent black, seven point five percent Hispanic. District three, thirty eight percent white. 17.7% black, 16.9% Hispanic, 8.3% white, 52.9% black, 24.9% uh, Hispanic, uh, District 2 with 15.6% Asian, 17.1% Asian in District 3, and District 4 with 4.4% Asian. And is the population right on that, Wayne? Uh, it has a deviation, maximum deviation of one district, the highest with 7.2%. So, so district four is low there. Right, so Brian, is there an area where, through the chair, is there an area where Brian would pick up a pocket that I'm missing? Is it 16-1? Is it Which would be where, just 16-3, 64, 16 16-1? So if you would add 16-1, Wayne? No, 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 oh. no. 16 one and 16-3 would be together. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you, you were next. Oh, hang on, let's see. Where, hold on, do be next. Sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 I was just talking. Um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I know that I stated yesterday um, in our working session in Piemonte Room um, a response to Kenzie's, uh, or Councilor Bach, uh, pardon, um, uh, proposal to remove 85. Um, I wasn't sure, were you still suggesting to remove 85 again today, or where are we with this? Ma Madam Chair, um, I, so I didn't suggest to remove 8.5, um, but yesterday I suggested 13.4, um, but I didn't today suggest either of those. So that wasn't, I was, I was only discussing the question of 4.5 um, coming back in today. I was just saying that perhaps we would s see if, if um, we could move 15.2 in to, um, which is over, that's over on the D3, D4 border. So it didn't, didn't I, I heard you, uh, Councillor Fernandez Henderson, on the 13-4 front yesterday, so I didn't make that suggestion today. Thank you. I guess, I guess I'm, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Bach. I, I guess I'm a little confused in terms of the exchange when I came back. I do apologize, uh, Madam Chair. I had to attend to a couple of uh, urgent matters in my district, but um, so, you're not suggest through the chair, uh, Council Bach. You, you're not official. You're not still recommending to remove black and brown districts or precincts out of District Seven. That's correct. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Worrell. Do you have a? I saw your light on a moment ago. You. Oh uh, no, I have no questions at this. Okay. Moment. So, um, so, so let's see, the,
You folks, so, uh, Councillor Flaherty, I think you wanted to have a copy of one of these printed out. Map, Wayne, it says 611. There, there, isn't, there is no 611, it's 610, unless it's my eyes. It said 611, there's, no, there's not 11 precincts in. There was one recently created, yeah, so technically. Yeah. 611 and 610. New, new precincts that were created. Yeah, we did add 20 this year, so yeah. yeah it's hard it. to keep up. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, then Councillor Baker. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I guess I'm wanted to know if. In, I mean, moving forward, anyone, it's up to anyone's discretion to file motions for amendments. Um, so that's on each individual councillor. But um, in moving forward till, to tomorrow, I just wanted to extend my support to you and say that I know that this is like very difficult. I, I'm with Chair Ways and Means um, experience. Like I, that, that was tough too. And, but I think you actually have done a really good job. And I really liked that you presented all of the meetings, all of the working sessions, and all the community meetings that um, on record. Um, I think that's important to show, and if folks wanted to do more, I've already expressed um, yesterday, and I think it's important to express it here today while being televised, that um, we have, we, we as counselors have the responsibility to bring the information, to include our communities, and to be transparent. And I think that we have done that, um, and if folks felt if my colleagues felt that they needed to do more or further community engagement, that was up to their discretion. And if they haven't, then no judgment. I, it's none of my business what you do in your district, but um, that, that is open for everyone. It's our responsibility. So I would say, I would continue to say that, um, you know, if I, I'm not sure what's going on in terms of like uh, the exchanges, but I wanted to publicly extend my support to you and say, um, if you are getting any type of like backlash in terms of your decision-making process or this process in itself, um, I'm here to say that um, as your colleague, as a black woman here, you are my uh, uh, white counterpart, you're my sister, and I stand with you in your decision. I know it's been very difficult. Um, I appreciate that you've been holding your head up high, and I know that this can be very difficult, but you do not deserve any type of backlashing or yelling, um, and I stand in support with you with whatever decision that you make in respecting your process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Baker, is he here or is he? Okay. Councillor uh, uh, Mejia. Yes, so it would be helpful um, as we wrap up this session just to get some things on like what's on the table, what are we gonna be coming back to on Wednesday, like you know, the discussion that just happened between the colleagues that are in this chamber today, just uh, it would just be helpful for a recap um, so that we walk out of here with a real clear understanding of what is at play and what we're going to be walking back into. And I'd like to second my um, a colleague in terms of just uh, the, your ability to shepherd us through this very difficult process. Really do appreciate it and look forward to understanding what are the next steps. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor um, Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, uh, Council Mejia, for your support. I think, you know, allowing, let's allow, and of course it's up to you, uh, Madam Chair, but allowing the, mad the Madam Chair uh, the grace to be able to make those decisions, process it, and come back to us. Either, um, it, it, either it's, a, it's a communication later on or tomorrow. It's totally up to you. So allowing her the grace to do that and not necessarily be under pressure today and respond. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Worrell? Um, I would like to, Wayne, if you have a moment, offer up some suggestions. Yes, so on screen is docket 1275 as filed. All right, um, so basically it's restoring District 4 in its current district, um, removing 1601. So 1601 back to District 4? No, uh, no, so keeping that in okay. District 3. District 3. Right. 
So just restoring everything else. So as 1702, five. back to District 4, 1706, uh -huh. um, 1603, okay. and then removing 1609, 1612. 1609, 1612, uh, as filed there in District 4, right, so, so back, back to District, District 3. three. Yep. Okay. And then putting District, I mean, precinct... Uh, 1408 is already there. 1807, 1912, and District 3. District 4? District 4, sorry. 1807 yeah. and 1912. 1912. Okay. Yeah. And then what does that do for District District 4's numbers? Uh, it has it at 77,802. And then the evaluation? District 4. 12.3% white, 49.5% black, 24.4% Hispanic. And what does it do for District 3? Um, District 3 with 40.2% white, 16.9% black, 16.2% Hispanic. All right, so if you go to the north, on uh, like I guess coming down from 601, 610, like we're moving those from District, putting those back into District 2. Put in 601 back in District 2, 705. Okay. And 63? Yep, and 63. 705. 705. 76? Um, no, not 76. But then, this is something I saw Council Flaherty do as well as 801, 801 and 901 in District 2. Yes, they are in District 2. I mean, District 3, sorry. 8191 to District 3. Where are we at in terms D of? District 2 is 79,105. District 3 is 70,718. Oh, and then 405 into District 7. District seven. Four, four, five in District 7. Uh, 76,167 for District 2, 70,718 for District 3. 75,085 for District 7. What's the, what's the standard deviation on that? Uh, it has the total maximum deviation for one district at 5.8. I must be missing something. Oh, 1502 to District, to district um, 3. 1502 from District 4 to District 3? And then what's the evaluation? It has it at 4.79 as the highest deviation. Uh, District 3 at 35.6% white, 18.7% black, 17.9% Hispanic, 12.5% white for District 4, 49.7% black, 24.4% Hispanic. That kind of, that meets what the um, original NAACP map was at 35% prior to the proposed amendment. 30, say it again? 38. 38, okay. For what? It was 35? Okay. For, for what number, Brian? Uh, for District 3. Percentage of white? Right. Just for consideration. Thank you for your um, consideration. Thank you for your offering. Uh, Councillor um, Baker. I, I understand, you know, I appreciate the work, but again, splitting my communities. You know, you're either taking them, taking them together, or you're leaving them together, is what my suggestion is. <clears throat> this is what. Never mind. Just stay on the dialogue. Regarding 16.8 and 16.11, which is what Council Baker was saying is dividing a neighborhood, is there any two, if those go to District 3, 16.8 and 16.11 stay in District 3, where could you pick up to offset that to, again, match the numbers? I don't think it, uh, I don't think it works after that. If 
you need. So stay right there. Council Rural, Council Baker, is there anything on that map where if 16.8, 16.11 stays in D3, what can go to D4? Can I see the top of it, Wayne? Yes. Well, 8.1 and 9, one, the advocates have been telling us to leave it in District 2. There's, there's common language there. Okay. If we're looking to vote tomorrow, I'll be amendable, but that's something that the, the, the advocates asked for. I mean, I'm looking to get a map here, and I'm looking, I'm looking to, to keep communities of interest in District 3 together. Because as a district councilor, there's a certain agenda that, that arrives from your boundaries. And, and the further I get spread out, that agenda becomes more disjointed. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson. Apologies. Um, uh, Madam Chair, if uh, we could zoom into D4, I just want to see the difference. Yes. Um, Councillor Worrell, uh, Vice Chair, can you please um, break this map down, what it does to your district? Um, so it, in terms of numbers or? In terms of numbers, community interest and in Yeah, it brings back uh, Common Square, uh, definitely unites Common Square. In terms of numbers, it increases my white population uh, to 12.5%. 12 12.5%. 12 um, my black population actually goes down to 49.9%. Um, it keeps a majority of my borders uh, the same, but then I do pick up 1611 to 16, 1608. Um, Unites Fields Corner um, in 1601, and also uh, unites a lot more Bowdoin Street in 1502. Um. Sorry, Madam Chair, uh, through the chair, Council Baker, can you explain to me what this suggestion does to your district? It's, it's right there. It splits my, from the beginning, community of interest. Hey, Brennan saying in, split. I mean, it's one thing if, if you take, take the remaining precinct at the same price. This is a community of interest that's been, that's been um, advocating for people in this district. I don't see how people continually come after these these this is a neighborhood this is a real neighborhood here these are people that work hard they they they, they play sports together they they do nearly everything together come down to Florian Hall when we have when we have a, um, when we have a time for someone someone dying of cancer or kids sick this that come to Florian Hall There's 2,000 people in there from that community look at the picture of, of Garvey Park after after um after the, the bombing. There were 1,500 people down there to support the, the Richards family, all from that community, all colors. You know, this is a community. I can't, can't say it anymore. And to, and to have it, and have this called the District 3 Project, how, how can I not take it personal? How can, how can I not? This is where I grew up. Dorchester is in my blood, and you guys are taking it. It's splitting it up and saying, oh, if we just go up, it, like very nonchalant, we'll just go up there, just go up there. Communities of interest, the closer you are together, the better work you do together. This should be about togetherness, not going in and slicing to get four percentage points on a white population. It, it, to me, it all feels like we're going backwards in this. And again, I know I don't make any friends around here. I own all that. Still doesn't mean that we should be trying to hurt a district that that I think works pretty good together. I yeah I I agree with you that we shouldn't try to hurt communities. Um, what well, this, about this what about at the top? I mean I'm. Let's go up the hold top. on. I'm Let's fine. Uh, excuse me, Councilor Baker. Let, um, Councilor, I'm, 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 I'm trying to rev get this. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you you have the chair. Sorry you for the phone. back and forth. I guess I'm I'm asking. Can we move up to understand South Boston? What's happening with the suggestion? Yeah, uh, Wayne, can we take a look at the South Boston? What do you think of that? Okay, so 7-7 seven, seven I got 10 years ago. 
Um, that's that's right on at, at Moakley Park, Carson Beach. The work that I do, and, I, and maybe we're not supposed to talk about work, but I'm going to. Three, um, 13, no, yeah, 13, three is there, which is Columbia Point, which is where all the, um, the UMass development's gonna happen. That is centrally located, that's a centralized location for what's going to be happening in terms of resiliency, berms, and other, and other things that co connected directly to 13.3 and moving, moving around 7.7 7 to protect that area right there because one of the pinch points when the water rises, it, it's, its plan, the water's plan, has come directly across Smokely Park directly through the Mary Ellen McCormick housing projects, and from that point, it floods Lower Roxbury and Back Bay and the rest of the city that way. So very much, very much an interest. Seven, six is, you know, we're, we're splitting housing developments there. If this group wants me to take seven, six, and, and they're dealing with the, the advocates, I'll take seven, six. I'm looking to get to a map with, with, with my communities of interest don't get harmed for two or three percentage points one way or another. To get Brian to 14%, you need to cut out five of my, five of my precincts that are a cohesive unit. They work together. We should be applauded. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Fernandez anderson have you any? Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Murphy? Oh, Councillor Warrell, I think you and then Councillor Murphy. Oh, um, no, my light wasn't on. I was from last time. Your so. light wasn't on. That looks like a light that's on over there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Murphy. Yes. Um, and through the chair to Councillor Fernandez Anderson, I'm um, not sure if you were in the room, but I had made a few changes that I would like to do again so that we can see, because I also agree with Councillor Baker. I grew up in this neighborhood, so I know it. And if people are looking at 16.9, do you know, and it's not a challenge question, I'll just say, you probably don't realize that you're cutting, if you only give 16.8 and 11 to District 4 and you give back 16.9 and 12 to District 3, you're going to Gallivan Boulevard and you're going to be cutting down Granite Ave in that whole neighborhood on the other side of the cemetery. And then you're gonna be going up Adam Street right through one of the busiest and growing business districts in District 3 right now, which is Adam's Corner. So like I've said to people, you could be at dinner at Molinari's on one side or in the Erie Pub, and you'd be in District 4, and then you cross the street to get a scone at Green Hills and a cup of tea, and you're in District 3. And if you go up a little further to Ashmont Street, you can see it zigzags. You'd go down Ashmont Street in 169, it's gonna be cut along Newhall Street. It's just cuts into that neighborhood, houses, parks. So I do believe that those four, 16, eight, nine, 11, and 12 should move as a block. And Wayne, if we could get back to the original, and then if we moved those four back into District Four, um, I mean, move those back into District Three. <laughs> Keep 17, 13 in District 4. Then we picked up 1907. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, from so the map as filed? From here. the map Oops. as filed, put 16, 8, 9, 11, and 12 back into District, District 3. 3. Yep. Keep 17, 13 in District 4. Okay. 16, 11? Yep. District 3. Yep. Okay. 8, 9, 11, and 12, that block at the bottom. Eight, nine, so we're 11, keeping 12. that neighborhood intact. And then on the other side, pick up 1907. And then there were a few other small changes we made up. Um, 1706 would go to District 4. And then we would keep 161 and 163 together, but shift that to District 4. And where are we there? Were there other changes I had made up, up in South Boston, or does that? What What is the part? Okay, I think that was. Yes, it has District Three at seventy six thousand one hundred two, yeah. District Four at seventy two thousand four hundred ninety two. And um, 
Could you go to the demographics? Yes. So it has District 3, 41.2% white, 17.2% black, 15.8% Hispanic. Yeah. District 4 at 10% white, 50.9% black, 24.6% Hispanic. Thank, Thank you. you. But I do believe that in the map that Councillor Baker, the amendments Councillor Baker proposed, could you just flip those back up so yes. we could look? So do you have those written down or do you need us to repeat those? If we went back I to the base? I think this is it here. That's it, right? Yeah. And right there we get 15% in District 4? Oops. Correct? Uh, District 4, 14.8% white, 49.3% black, 23.4% Hispanic. And that block of neighborhoods stay together. <coughs> they go to District 4, but they do stay together. What's the demographic score? Sorry, I'm sure I asked. Yeah. Three? District 3 would then be 37.8% white, 18.9% black, 16% Hispanic. Pretty much the same in District 3, but it does increase the white population dramatically, which is what many councillors are saying that they, they would like to see it up above. Were there any other changes, Councillor Baker, you had made? Because that kept the housing communities together, right? Yep. I mean, I'm not sure if when amendments are proposed, I think I'm a visual person. This is an important vote that we actually look at each one and kind of talk through, especially the district council is sharing if any drastic changes are made into their district, which we heard this morning. When there's no need, we shouldn't just be making changes to make changes, but absolutely make them when we want to be in line with the Voting Rights Act. Thank you, Councillor um, Flaherty, then Flynn. Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I obviously want to pick up on where our colleague, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, was going in terms of kind of boiling down to the issues with respect to District 3 and District 4 and finding out between the respective um, councillors that represent those districts along with District 2 because District 2 has to shed um, and again trying to build consensus and um, you know fostering collegiality here. How do we turn around and is there some push and pull here that sort of again adheres to all the principles that we need to adhere to and must adhere to at the same time gets us to a place where um, council is in their respective districts to the best of our ability to uh, uh, remain together and whole and cohesive. So I guess I'll present or put pose to my colleague from District 4 and my colleague from District 3 and also my colleague from District 2 because that's frankly where a lot of the movement is and I know it involves District 7 and District 8 for the most part. Uh, and maybe a little bit in District 1, but collectively, you know, can we find a way to do a deeper dive and uh, a micro analysis of the, you guys know your districts better than anybody. Um, can we have a very frank discussion as to what precincts can move in and out of um, these districts? Uh, again, following up on, I, th I think that's where Council Fernandez was going, was kind of doing a little bit of a deeper dive, frankly, wish uh, more of our colleagues were here because this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, folks. So, again, I pose that question to D4, to D3, and to D2. Are uh, there any precincts here that you folks are aware of that you know, and you know the breakdown, you know the demographic breakdown, you know the neighborhoods and the cohesiveness that can exchange or move in and out of uh, districts to try to get to a point where we could, you know, we're not going to be happy. Not everyone's getting a whole loaf, but a half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf in some instances give a little bit to get a little bit so that's where I'm at Madam Chair so I pose that question to each of my colleagues and would like to hear from them um, as to what precincts that they think could move in and out that again would keep our the numbers consistent with where we need to be yeah, yeah. Councillor Flynn 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to highlight looking at the map and looking at different proposals, but it's always been my strong goal is to keep 6175 and 76 in, in South Boston, into District 2. Um, that would be important. I highlighted that many times over the last several, several weeks for various, for various reasons, but 7172 and 73, those, those would be non-starters for me. I, 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 I would never accept 7172 and 73 leaving District, District 2. Madam Chair, I, I provided to all of my co colleagues at least 10 precincts that I recommended, may, maybe more, maybe 11, 10 or 11 precincts that I recommended that might be, um, <clears throat> that I, I would be willing to, to provide, you know, to depart, I guess that's the word, um, and that would be part of a, a new district. Um, and they were all excellent precincts in terms of the, the demographics, but you know, I've, I've been a part of this process here and I've, I don't think I've been accommodating in providing as much information as I can on precincts that must or probably could be shed from District 2. Again, I highlighted those publicly to all of my colleagues, so it's not a, it's not a, um, a secret. Um, the only thing I, I, I do feel bad about is someone, someone put it on the internet and, and a lot of my constituents in that area are disappointed in me and, 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 I, and I don't blame them to be honest with you but that's unfortunately that's part of the that's part of the redistricting process yeah. um, but you know I'll have to do a lot of work to make up the credibility I lost by publicly saying to them that um, you know I, I would be willing to depart from district 2 but 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 let me just let me just reference what I said at the beginning. I, I would really uh, six one seven five and seven six really need to stay in, in part of D two, and seven one seven two and seven seven three. Those would be non-starters for me to have those move from district two to another, whether it's district three or district one. Um, th that, would be, that would be a non-starter for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm cognizant of the time. Um, we have a uh, working, uh, Councillor Box committee has a, um, a meeting here at 2 o'clock. I propose to recess until 2.30, no, it's 3.30, and come back in to further discuss uh, our options. And uh, the, 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 we will be making um, uh, we, we will re we'll recess for now and come back at 3.30. Yes, Councillor Baker. Oh, Councillor, hold on. Oh, yeah, we... Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. I apologize. It was just uh, really quick. If we could go to Councillor Rorell's map and work with some of what Councillor Flynn is suggesting. Can we do that in the afternoon session? Absolutely. Thank you. We'll put that on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bach, you, or Councilor, did you have a comment to make before? Just a very brief, um, just to say that I just wanted to register that, like, within the context of the amendments that were discussed, I just wanted to double down again on the fact that I think I think it is important to move the public housing back into South Boston. And so, even though I thought it was inelegant of the precincts left, like keeping six, like doing six one and six ten as the two that go out because they don't have any public housing. I just wanted to flag that as an opinion. Um, and then the other thing is just to say to folks who don't know that the um, the hearing uh, today is on the Boston Teachers Union contract. Um, it has to be approved by the council in order to get funded. It's gone through an extensive process and so it's here now and there's been a strong request from our employees there to have us here and meet on it. That's why it's happening today at two. Um, but I do hope that it can be an expeditious hearing and we can be done by 3, 3.15 um, so that this hearing can reconvene. But just wanted to flag that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Baker, one quick note, because we need to... No, uh, I understand, uh, yeah. Um, so I can't go into Southie in, in the sixes. I can't, I can't go this way. Again, we had another council lay out his Jerusalem 
Yeah, we my need- Jerusalem is Ward 16. My Jerusalem are those high precincts down there. Please Thank respect you. them. Thank you. Are you either taking all of them or you're taking none of them? Thank you, Councillor Baker. He has to grow. It just seems it doesn't seem right that we're starting off by cutting off the whole bottom of a district when we already know it has to grow and it is then forced into district two where other councillors are saying you can't come in you know there's I many councillors saying don't touch these borders if we keep those four precincts in Neponset, dorchester and the south there yeah. there's less we have to disrupt in other districts let's continue the conversation this afternoon 3 30. This, this meeting's recess.